Coming up on Windows Weekly, I, Micah Sargent, join Paul Thorat and Richard Campbell, and we kick off the show talking about the AI reorg at Microsoft. That's right, there's a new Microsoft AI organization within the company that reports directly to Satya Nadella. Then a very short section on what's new in Windows, by way of Windows 10, what in the world? Then Microsoft 365, including some AI updates and some lack of AI updates, depending on what programs you are using. We also talk about Apple maybe partnering with Google on AI and where Microsoft plays into all of that. Uh, upcoming Surface event from Microsoft. And of course, we've got Xbox Corner and the tips and picks of the week as well. All of that coming up on Windows Weekly. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by Zscaler, the leader in cloud security. Cyber attackers are using AI in creative ways to compromise users and breach organizations. In a security landscape where you must fight AI with AI, the best AI protection comes from having the best data. Zscaler has extended its zero trust architecture with powerful AI engines that are trained and tuned by 500 trillion daily signals. Learn more about Zscaler Zero Trust plus AI to prevent ransomware and AI attacks. Experience your world secured. Visit zscaler.com slash zero trust AI. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat, Richard Campbell, and this week, Micah Sargent. Episode 873, recorded Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. Amino Man. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Melissa, the data quality experts since 1985. Melissa offers free trials, sample codes, and flexible pricing, ROI guarantee, unlimited technical support to customers all around the world, and Melissa's international address validation cleans and corrects street addresses worldwide. Addresses automatically transliterate from one system to another, for example, Chinese to Cyrillic. You can download the free Melissa Lookup app on Google Play or the App Store, no sign-up is required. With it, you can validate an address and personal identity in the U.S. or Canada. You can check global phone numbers to find caller, carrier, and geographical information, and check global IP address information plus more. Melissa has achieved the highest level of security status available by gaining FedRAMP authorization. While these technologies are exclusively for governmental agencies, all Melissa users automatically gain this superior level of security. Melissa's solutions and services are GDPR and CCPA compliant and meet SOC 2 and HIPAA high trust standards for information security management. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. It's time for Windows Weekly. I am Micah Sargent, subbing in for Leo Laporte, who is currently on vacation, getting a tan and whatnot. But I am here to join the two veteran Windows washers of the world. It is, first, Paul Therott. Uh, joining us from Makunji. Is it Lower Makunji? Is it not? That's a conversation <laughs> for not We now. don't have enough time for this <laughs> exactly. conversation. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, Paul? I am doing well, thank you. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you for asking. Uh, also first, see how we did that? <laughs> Joining mm, us from nice. Madeira Park, BC, Canada, it's Richard Campbell. Hello, Richard. Hey, Micah. It's great to be home for a change because it won't be true next week. You're always <laughs> all over the place. It's an yeah, interesting life you lead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's funny how the, uh, the audience has gotten into this, you know, instead of getting guests from all over the world, we just send the hosts everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Right. One, one of these days, I'm going to have to get your your tips on travel, because as much as you travel, I'm sure you've got plenty of how you make it happen where it's not a slog and mm. a, a terrible time on planes and whatnot. Maybe I you just do that. Richard is teleport. like a hedgehog and he just rolls up into a little ball and then yeah. the plane lands and ro unrolls himself. I, I miss most flights. I fall asleep as we pull off the gate. I wake up yeah. as the tires touch the ground. I am. I actually thought about that for my next flight, uh, making that happen. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're see, 
Micah, you know, you're you're normally sized, so I think flying for you is not as hard as it would be for me, at least, mm -hmm. and maybe for Richard. I just, I, I, we got it. We got a dog five years ago. It was a really big animal, really gangly, and and I, I could tell very quickly. Like this dog is never comfortable, right? You could just tell she'd have to move around all the time. She could never be comfortable, and I was like, I get it. This is how I am on a plane. <laughs> you know, I am six no three. Normal sitting, you know, yeah, just yeah, can't do it. So my, You're taller than you look, Mike. Yeah, I'm six three, so my legs end up being. Oh, kind are you of, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just keep going. Yeah. No. Then so you I have apologize. the problems. That's that's no, that's okay. It's funny. That's it's a very common thing I get. Anytime I meet somebody in person, wow, you're taller than I thought you were. And I thought, taller what does that say about my presentation? Sure. I just must be very small. But anyway, let's do this show. Let's talk about <laughs> Windows because there was kind of a big announcement uh, mm -hmm. Satya Nadella put forth and it is time to do a shakeup, <laughs> a reorganization yeah. at Microsoft. Uh, no one's throwing any CEOs to the curb or anything like that. It's not that level of shakeup, but um, certainly some well, restructuring. Well, I guess, yeah, no, I, yeah. Then again, tell, tell us about well, it. Well, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to think. I, honestly, I'm, I, I, I think there's more story here than we know so far because when I look at this, this re, this reorg, and I should just say for at a high level, involves Microsoft creating what they called a new organization, which is kind of an interesting word, uh, called Microsoft AI, that reports directly to Satya Nadella. It is uh, led by former uh, co-founders of an AI company called Inflection, and uh, one of whom is the, I guess the the CEO of that business or whatever we're going to call this organization. Uh, the other one of whom was the other co-founder and former chief scientist. Um, these are not, my, uh, these are not people from Microsoft. No, <laughs> you I, know? I, I, I think I mean, this is an acquisition disguise of a reorg. Yeah. So, right. Maybe a mini version of what could have happened with open AI where, uh, Sam Altman had been deposed and everyone said, we're leaving. And Microsoft said, well, welcome to Microsoft. And, the, right. and that might have happened. Yeah. Um, yeah, that could be. Uh, I, I just find it interesting that it isn't more of a mix of Microsoft people and these new people. Yeah, I think um, it there will are, be. I just think this is early days that, that they've managed yeah. to, to basically recruit out the leadership of Inflection, who are also right. drivers behind DeepMind. Uh, yep. which I think is That's a very we had, look open AI is the was the gutting of Google brain mm -hmm. this feels like the gutting of deep mind and deep mind while we always think of it as the go company they're the guys who cracked go that's not the important thing they're working on <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the, That's right. the important thing is alpha fold they, they they've mm -hmm. largely solved protein folding for the medical industry and have open sourced it by the way mm -hmm. uh and so it's like we're in the midst of a medical transformation from the ability of the software to do protein folded calculations that basically were impossible any other way oh. and to the point where we even have trouble <laughs> I mean, validating what they've done right but i mean okay but i'm i'm just i'm trying to understand how this works within microsoft you know right, it's a right. very yeah, I, I think it I was just a lucky grab. You got two incredible rock stars that want to come on board. Yeah. Take them. Okay, <laughs> but so, but obviously there is a, uh, you know, some set of uh, employees and executives at Microsoft who are already were were already leading the AI charge there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just find this interesting. I'm I'm curious how this kind of plays out. Plus yeah. I feel like the description of who goes where is somewhat incomplete at this time. So for example, everybody, pro well, most people hopefully probably know that Microsoft CTO, Kevin Scott was, you know, personally responsible for bringing together open AI and Microsoft and starting yeah. that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, he's been rewarded for that be by being named executive vice president of AI <laughs> in addition to his job as, you know, just being CTO generally of Microsoft and has been, and is still is, apparently, uh, re responsible for Microsoft's overall AI strategy. But that itself creates a very strange dynamic because the person who is directly responsible for Microsoft's AI strategy is not in charge of their AI business. And the person who is does not report to him. He reports directly to Satya Nadella. Um, and, and I guess Kevin this- Scott. I'm sorry. 
Uh, well, no, I meant the the guy from uh, Deep yeah. Mind. Uh, I apologize, Suleiman uh, Mustafa Suleiman. Mm -hmm. So you you've got this. It's it's interesting, right? Now we already know about things like Copilot and uh, and where Copilot is in Bing and Edge and elsewhere and Microsoft 365 and Windows, et cetera. That team is moving into Microsoft AI and will report to that new person. Um, there is a Gen AI team uh, that was separate that will also move into that business and report to Mr. Suleiman. Um, no word about Windows, nothing there. Although they mentioned that Rajesh Jha, who is responsible for uh, the experiences and de devices division or business or whatever we want to call that, uh, which is oversees Microsoft 365 and Windows. Um, he's continuing in his position and will partner closely with this new team on Copilot for Microsoft 365. No word on, on Windows. Although, you know, again, uh, or I, I, as we've said in the past, I should say, you know, Copilot on Windows is just another front end for Copilot that has some Windows specific stuff, but that's not particularly interesting. But I, I, I find it, interesting that they did not mention windows and yeah i think you're hitting on the big part here uh paul that this isn't about front ends this is about back ends yes and so open ai is a back end that azure is wrapping and now this could easily be a totally different back end this could be you know derived from the deepmind yeah. generative models or yeah or it, right uh, well, i mean and i look at the relationship they have with mistral now as well yep. as another back end option well, I think, look, that kind of diversification is smart, <laughs> right? Um, I think a lot of people, you could be all in on this, be very excited for Microsoft's direction with AI, but you still should look at this open AI thing and say, wow, this is um, putting a lot of eggs in one basket, you know, yeah. the future of the company. They seem to be getting more server. baskets now and they're keeping them separate yeah. from each other, which I think yeah, is which probably is smart. Interesting. Right. Yeah. And and I should, I should know too, they were very specific that uh, we're continuing this uh, open AI relationship, which uh, Nadella described as the most strategic and important partnership that Microsoft has, right? I mean, duh, but it's it's always nice to have that spelled out. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what to make of this. I Even when Microsoft first announced what was then called Bing Chat about a year ago, February, I think it was, February, January, whenever that was, um, there was some description, I think it was probably... Uh, I can't, it doesn't matter who said it, but there was some description that you know we have this open AI chat GPT technology that's kind of the foundation. But we're we're you know, Microsoft described like they were McDonald's, like they're adding some secret sauce on top of it. And that secret sauce included such things as uh, Bing search results for the internet stuff, and then they wouldn't talk about the rest of it, right? Um, okay. <laughs> but I, I I we can debate whether pure open AI chat GPT or Microsoft's kind of flavor of it is better, whatever that means, et cetera, et cetera, more accurate, whatever it is. Uh, I guess we could just have that discussion, but I, I, it was, I don't know. I, I, I've always been a little nervous about that relationship with open AI. And I wonder if this doesn't, isn't the, st the it's not the start, but a big step toward trying to diversify and make sure that nothing I think bad it is. happens there. And I think there's lots of reasons for them to do it. Yeah. Um, not the yeah. least of which is that they're being heavily scrutinized for their relationship with OpenAI. Yes. And right. so one of the right. ways you make it less threatening is say, we have a lot of relationships. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but even if it did end up being restricted, they have alternatives. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so I, I mean, you know, we'll see. I, I, I feel like there's always this weird thing that can happen with not just Microsoft, any big company where one day there's a couple of people on stage and then the next day things happen and the next event there's different people on stage, you know? So as re as soon as build in May, we might see some of these people maybe for the first time at a Microsoft mm -hmm. event representing Microsoft. Right. And, uh, and then six months from then we'll see, we'll see if it's the same. I, I'm, I'm very curious about this. Uh, and, uh, you know, they don't, they're not presenting it as a reorg. It's a reorg. <laughs> right. I mean, very much as a reorg. Um, when you, especially when you consider that AI is the future of Microsoft explicitly stated. And now we have a new Microsoft AI business. That's yeah. our organization, I mean, the, as they call it. The opening line on the PR piece is they, he's joining to, to lead co-pilot. And I would argue that's yeah. a great way to solve a very impractical problem, which is that a year ago he told 
all these different product teams go make a co-pilot. Well, now they have, and it needs to be rationalized. Yeah. And and bringing in a, effectively an external actor to do that rationalization is one way to defeat the political problem that is it's rationalized. Not, yeah, and it, it's, it may be a way to trim back on some of the, uh, the co-pilot fat, mm. <laughs> you know, well, right? there's too it, much. You know, plenty of that is repetitive. Like the good news about what he requested to do is everybody experimented and you're going to find some great experiments, but you're also going to find a lot of derivative work. And so, yes. you know, nobody wants yep. 200 co-pilots, even if 200 exist. Really, arguably, exactly, we want exactly. one and they keep making gestures like there's going to be one while continuing to announce more. So right, right. Uh, maybe Mustafa is the guy that can actually line all this up. I we we're going to find out. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, well, I mean, there have been other uh, acquisitions that have led mm. to big uh, executives coming in and not lasting a long time mm. necessarily. Or not, not sometimes wrong. people, yeah, well, people get. I, put, I mean, I look at poor Miguel Diacaza, and I have nothing. You know, Miguel's crying all the way to bank. He's fine. But one of the first missions when he joined Microsoft was to rationalize XAML, and that yeah. was. Almost an impossible task, which I was going to say, I, I, did they succeed at that? I, mm, <laughs> I today, that Well, moment. they did, but I don't think it was Miguel in the end, but I would argue the rationalization of XAML is Maui. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I, you're probably right. It's just that, unfortunately, Maui is, in the words of a fish called one of the smallest freaking province of Microsoft. And, you know, yeah, I don't know. That, that wasn't going to change the fact that the it wasn't going to be better fragmented. So they have that's at least, that, no, that, at that, least that, got everybody working together. That is true. More or less. So yeah, I, it's, uh, not, it's not as big and important to play. But I mean, the other, the other side of this is this is also very much a Gatesian playbook. Keep yeah. shuffling the cards. Do not let empires be built. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I sure. I mean, I, 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 I 100% agree. Uh, some of the Copilot creep needs to be reined in. I, there's a you, you don't have to follow this industry at all to kind of already have a feeling of almost AI fatigue just mm -hmm. this quickly, right? Um, and that maybe this stuff needs to be corralled a little bit and and simplified, and we'll see. But uh, yeah, I do feel like we were on a path to a, a new copilot every week for 2024, and maybe that's too much. Mm. Uh, I, 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 and it is too much. It, it is there's too much, already right. too sorry. many. <laughs> yeah, it is too much. Right. Um, and so whatever strategy you've got to take to find a way to make it easier for all of us to consume the thing we want to consume. I mean, yeah. what would be worse than to be typing into the wrong co-pilot? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I laughed. That's actually it's hilarious. But I think that's how the, term the, the Terminator movies start that way. Yeah, um, exactly it. Yeah. I yep. meant the world. I, I meant my Minecraft world, not the whole world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like when you send an email to the wrong people and they're like, you know, this is yeah. work, right, Bob? Uh, I don't know yeah. what those sexy pictures were all about, but uh, maybe you didn't mean to send it out to the group. Uh, yeah, I, you could. Yeah, you could do some real damage. Um, hmm. I mean, I, I can't help but think about the Windows end of this for me, and I guess there is no Windows end. I mean, um, we, we're still in that same holding pattern where the industry is trying to sell us on MPUs, but there is nothing that takes advantage of MPUs that anybody cares about. Right. In fact, there's almost nothing at all that takes advantage of it anyway. And uh, we still haven't seen anything that, you know, changes that. I mean, there's been some rumors around blah, 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 whatever happening later this year. But um, if uh, so all this does is make background blur and paint or photos slightly faster than it is now, that's not going to be good enough, right? Because yeah. actually this stuff works fine right now. Yeah, the uh, MPUs that work right now are in your phones. There's nothing happening in operating systems near as I can tell. Even on the Mac side, really. Well, yeah. I mean, so uh, I don't think that we've written about this on Throughout.com, but there was a, I think, I don't know if it was German or someone else had a, a rumor or a report from sources inside uh, Apple, and we're going to talk about some Apple AI stuff later, actually, but um, about how this would impact like iOS in the future, right? It's probably something I can know a little bit about, like mm -hmm. the, um, these were like, you know, we're, here's the list of how we're going to use generative AI in the product. And, and there's nothing surprising, like it all makes sense. It's all very logical. It's the type of thing we see elsewhere. If 
you can look at what maybe Google is doing on the Pixels or Samsung's doing on the latest phones. Be like, yeah, no, I mean, this, this makes sense. Yeah, parody. But then you look at Windows and you're like, um, so what are we doing? <laughs> like, no, what's the point? I, I still think Windows runs alongside every other product at Microsoft now, which is people yeah. still struggle with. It's not the flagship product anymore. Azure is. Right. And so the Windows team has to get their own acting. Well, even on the client, it's not relevant. the flagship product, right? It's it's kind of weird. It's Microsoft 365. I mean, I think by virtue of the fact that this thing runs everywhere, not just desktop, but also mobile and the web. Um, and actually, we'll touch on this later, too. But it's uh, it's a, a way to reach more customers with Copilot than is possible with Windows, right? Even yeah. if most of them are Windows users, um, the fact that you can get these capabilities in the web, mobile, Mac, whatever it might be, um, you know, it, 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 that's a bigger, that's just a bigger audience. It, it's, you know, it's I mean, not that I want to drive the digression, but here, let me drive the digression. <laughs> okay. <laughs> vroom, vroom. <laughs> if I had the firepower inside of the Windows team, this is where you build the ecosystem for all LLM interfaces. Right? right. This is your opportunity to reach out to all the product stacks to say Windows will be your gateway. Here's how you hook up to it so that all these products can work together. And then you can easily port that to the Mac and other platforms. But first you build an ecosystem, which shockingly is something Microsoft's actually good at. Yep. I, I just don't know that you, you know, the when I think about the firepower team for ecosystems inside of Microsoft right now, it's M365. Yep. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. And 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 by the way, I mean new app development at, at Microsoft 365, such as it is, is uh, web-based, right? We're not mm -hmm. talking about big new Microsoft, uh, I'm sorry, or Windows apps, right? Native Windows no, you're apps. you're talking about back end. Yeah, the innovations in the back end, the front yeah. end is Power Platform and other web-derived heterogeneous yeah. client solutions. Yep. Yeah, so, oh, I don't know. That's too bad. Anyway, I'd like to see an org chart. I'd like to see Microsoft be more transparent about who, what, where now. I mean, we used to have this, you could go to, you could look up senior leadership team at Microsoft.com and you get a, these black and white photos of the team and who they were and what they did and, you know, and all that stuff. And, and that day is just over. <laughs> you know, we don't really get that level of understanding. And, and I know part of it is probably just because it changes so much. Mm. I would also say, but, I don't name me a tech giant that does that anymore. Yeah. I think it's yeah. only, um, the information, the website, they, you, you have to pay for it. They are like the yeah. only folks out there. I see they who actually are keep track, of, keeping this kind of, track of this kind of stuff and have quite literally just that set up. I, I think this is tied to, uh, there have been no changes in the way that the SEC or whatever requires these companies to report earnings or whatever it might be, but all of them collectively have delivered less and less information over yeah. the years with no repercussions whatsoever. Since the SEC has and, essentially allowed these companies to obfuscate their income structures, yeah. they've no longer right. had declared members. That's right. right? Yeah, so I think this might be tied to that. It's uh, yeah. And even even this, orga I pointed this out when I first said this, you know, a Microsoft AI organization, what does that mean? You know, Microsoft has three primary business units, right? Um and a set Does of holy under one of those. Is it a fourth business unit? Yeah. Does it have a, because there is no direct financial accounting of any kind? Does it just sort of exist on the outside? You can make a case that, mm. uh, I, I, in fact, I bet Bill Gates would have made this case that there's you don't have an AI division. Everything's AI. Yeah, you know. No, and I think you're um, exactly right. I bet you this ends up being a wholly owned subsidiary, which up until now has been acquisitions ooh. they didn't want to wreck. Interesting, right? LinkedIn, okay. GitHub, like I and Bethesda, like you, those are yeah. all being run as wholly owned subsidiaries. I wonder if this is the first time they're going to make one. You know why they okay. would do this? One of the reasons. Well, regular. I mean, some antitrust issues. I think down that's the road. part of it. Yeah, but also now you have an excuse for everybody who wants to work on AI instead of Microsoft. Go apply to the other group. Oh, there you go. I mean, they do the same dynamic in the dev side between the dev div of Microsoft and GitHub, and folks float between them to some degree. Yeah. I wonder if yep. this is like a chance to, okay, everybody's working on it. Now we need to calm things down. If you really care that much about AI, go apply to the wholly owned art. Okay. I mean, I look, there are big and small versions of this throughout the history of Microsoft. Vermeer was handled this way a million mm -hmm. years ago when they bought the, the company that makes front page. Um, yep. A guy from Microsoft, uh, Chris, I can't think of his name, but left a position on the office team to become the, essentially the CEO of Vermeer. Mm -hmm which was uh, owned by Microsoft, you know, and, yeah. and like you said, GitHub, uh, Mojang, yeah. um, 
uh, Thomas Activision Sankey Blizzard. Over, so, yeah. Well, not really. Uh, Zenimax, I guess. Zenimax. Yeah, the gaming. I'll, I'll, the gaming is a little bit different. Yeah. Where you know, certainly what happened with GitHub with Nat Friedman coming in, and then now Thomas Demke. Like you, you are seeing Microsoft people move there, and, and all up and down the org. You know. Yeah, but that should time. be the point, right? That they go in and out. And, yeah. and that's fine. But this is, I would say, is by far the biggest because, like I said, Microsoft has made the explicit case. This is the future of the company. And then they've kind of yeah. backed that up by AIing everything, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, um, I think it's, I think they're creating an innovation center to certain, deal with certain things. Okay. I, I'm well, excited. It's almost like an AI guys, Microsoft really. research kind of a thing. I wonder. And I, and in, yeah. and the deep mind thing is what hit me the hardest. Be, just because what they're working on, I would argue, is one of the very first examples of a machine learning model exceeding human capability in a massive way. Our ability to manipulate <laughs> proteins with traditional software has been minor. We've barely been able to do it. I, I, and what DeepMind okay, pulled off in 2022 uh, at the CISP was profoundly important. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like Paul might disagree. I actually agree with- No, no, I just don't. Richard on that, to me, yeah. this is another planet. Like I don't, this, I, I don't know that this is not a Microsoft world to me, but- Yeah, and, it's, and this has got nothing to do with chat GPT and LLM and so forth. This is a different yeah. caliber of generative AI. Right. Um, right. And, and it, I mean, I care about it because too much of these technologies are steeped in science fiction. Right. You know, Arthur C. Clarke didn't write about folding proteins. Right, there's no MCU for for folding proteins, and yet this yeah. is astonishingly important. And machine I, learning models. I am sure one of those superheroes code. is based on folding proteins. There that's go. that's got to be a thing. Yeah, what We've can got you do? I can amino fold man. Proteins. I see. <laughs> <Amino> man. Uh, <laughs> you know. Oh dear, that's great, amino man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyhow, anything so else there's for uh, AI reorg before we take a break. No, that's the big one. I, 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 I feel like I've been saying this a lot lately, but uh, you know, the Microsoft security breach, for example, um, I just feel like there's more to the story. And I think Richard, it sounds like he completely agrees and maybe even knows more about it um, or has deeper suspicions than I, I guess. <laughs> um, but I think this is, I, I, but I wanted to just highlight that because I think, uh, I don't think we've heard the last of this. I think oh. this becomes more, you know, I think this becomes more. I guess if that makes sense. Or or it unravels. It could go either way. Like yeah, Joe Sharosh, when he came into the AI group at Microsoft, and a lovely man and brilliant. Yeah. But I think he slammed against the monolith that is Microsoft and couldn't yep. move things the way he wanted to and eventually moved on. And it might go that way. And I hope it doesn't. It could I also hope. be uh, like... Um, call it uh, bu, 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 oh boy quantum quantum computing right mm -hmm. three five ten whatever years ago there was a big microsoft made a huge breakthrough in quantum computing it was the focus of uh, ignite i think it was or build whatever that conference uh, was they, they did a piece on it but but no but they opened the show with it right remember yeah, yeah. that they was the one that were going to do That's... the nasa thing that fell apart and whatever but oh yeah but that was also uh, yeah. when everybody was having a run on quantum computing, but they've had a new set yep. of walls no i know it was definitely no there's definitely some uh yeah there's some competitive stuff there but they, the feeling was, okay, we're going to start hearing about quantum computing every year. And I got to mm. tell you, they've been pretty silent on that one. Yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever year that was. They smashed into hard bits. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you know, but you hit on an interesting point. Maybe what they're doing here is next gen beyond, beyond what OpenAI has been able to do. Interesting. And so this is creating a net, creating You're not going to replace us. To allow innovation. We're going to replace you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess we'll see. Yeah. I do. I, I, I feel like OpenAI Microsoft ends badly. Uh, and that's been kind of a background mm -hmm. fear for me. Because organizationally, the they're in conflict, right? Like, yeah, I, fundamentally, both, right. At fundamentally some point, trying to we will problem. outgrow our need for you. Yes. Yeah. And I think, and, and Satch has already been caught uh, unprepared once. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Around OpenAI. I don't think he's going to let it happen again. I suspect after that little incident where we saw, right. you know, Dark Satya for the first time, uh, that he went and went with his, you know, senior <laughs> folks and said, how are we going to make sure this never happened again? Besides putting an observer on the board, which he did with OpenAI, but in general, and one of it would obviously is let's make sure we're not dependent on them. What was that observer's name again? Grima Wormtongue? Was that? Yeah. Is that the right person? <laughs> I mean, Zing. I don't know. You're not going to believe what they're saying about you, Satya. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, well, let's ponder the yes, uh, grim worm, worm tongue of it all. <laughs> um, coming up, we'll be talking about Windows. Surprise, surprise here on Windows Weekly in just a moment. Breathe in. Breathe out. And we are back. It is time to talk about what's going on with Windows specifically over at Microsoft. Of course, joined as always by Paul Therott and Richard Campbell. Uh, I am subbing in for Leo Laporte, who will be back with you all next week. Uh, what's going on in the Windows world? I am surprised to say there hasn't been much in the way of insider builds, although now I see we today. Is that, yep. See, this is the new thing. Hey, wait till the show starts, set. man. Yeah, just <laughs> as the show starts. <laughs> Beep. Oh, starts. Um, <laughs> Maybe so we'll we get need to, that to move one to moment, Thursdays. But, should yeah. move to Thursdays. So in well, yeah, uh, I barely remember this, but the show started on Thursdays. I think we moved to Wednesdays about uh, 217 years ago. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Um, we, <laughs> I, we as a Windows community have a problem letting things go, right? So everyone knows that Windows 10 was never going to be updated. And my God, is that the new sticking point? Just like Windows 10 was going to be the last version of Windows. Remember that yep. little that little chestnut? Yeah. Um, people just, man, they have a hard time with this stuff. Let's call it aspirational. It's, <laughs> yeah. Right, right up until uh, the Mac. Just US, I don't know. Right? It's, it, it, it's I, I think making bold pronouncements is pretty much always a mistake, maybe, mm -hmm. is the issue here. But um, yeah, Windows 10 is getting new features, right? So Wait. That's didn't happening. You, didn't you say? Didn't yeah? But you said that was my, that was <laughs> that's my my favorite quote from a it was a listener reader or I guess a viewer was at a Microsoft. I just finished Barry Joe and I had done something post keynote. Got off the stage, talked to this group of people, and this guy out of the blue said, "But you said oh my. that Google would never buy YouTube." And he, and he kind of went on, but I stopped listening because I'm like, "Didn't Google buy YouTube like 20 years ago?" I'm like, "What yeah. are you talking about? I don't remember that. <laughs> I had to go look it up." And I did, I guess I speculated at one point 22 years ago, whenever this was, that Google would never buy YouTube. And then they did. So I'm always wrong now. Oh, my gosh. And I don't, I, you know, like people have that kind of memory, like mm. about the weirdest little details. Like wow. you, it's like you say something, it kind of just crawls in there in the brain or whatever. Um, tied to this, I have my own little insanity around the way that Microsoft updates Windows these days, right? Because it is uh, both illogical, sporadic and irrational. And unpredictable and not transparent and blah, 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 whatever. And what I mean by that is we have this insider program. I went on at length last week about this, I think. And they have different tiers, right? And you, you know, logically you introduce a feature in Canary and then move it down to dev and then move it to beta. And then when it moved into release preview, you could say, you know what? I think this feature might make it into the next version of Windows. But we don't have next versions of Windows and those things don't happen. And new features are introduced all over that scale. And sometimes new features are just introduced and stable and they've never been tested and it's hard to know what's going on. So now we have a new wrinkle uh, that it, that combines both of the things I just discussed, the uh, Windows 10 thing, the inability of people to let go and my insanity over how they introduce new features in Windows because there's a new feature coming to Windows 10 that they've never tested in Windows 11. <laughs> and you know what's coming to Windows 11 because it's so obvious, but it's just weird how they do things now, right? So uh, sometime in the past two months, months, whatever it was, uh, if you boot into your Windows 11 computer, you might have noticed what looks like a live tile in the middle bottom of the screen for some reason. That is the weather. It's the weather. It's, uh, they probably call it a card now because we can't use the term tile anymore. You don't want to give people PTSD. And why it looks different than everything else on the screen is kind of unclear, but there it is. And so that just appeared. And now they're testing new sports traffic and finance cards on the lock screen as well. Mm. But in Windows 10, not in Windows. I love it. I, love I this still game. have Windows 10 machines, so I'm going to get to see this, right? I just don't. Although they know begged to me say. constantly to upgrade them to 11. But now, I'm, now I've got a reason to hold out. Because uh, seeing more bad sources of news on my lock screen <laughs> really excites me. So there's still a lot uh, of Windows I don't, I don't, 10 users out there. Is that the reason? Oh, yes. There oh, are yeah. uh, at least 500 million of them. I mean, there's mm -hmm. probably more. It's, mo it's yeah, mostly in Mostly enterprise. on 10, not 11. Yeah. Right. Mo yeah. yeah. Especially it's, in the business side of things. 
this figure is probably not accurate anymore, yeah. but uh, for quite a while, it was it was kind of a two-thirds, one-third split between supported versions of Windows, where two-thirds was Windows 10. I think that's finally starting to come down. But uh, yeah, the, the majority of people running Windows today were running Windows 10. Um, so why aren't they doing bastards. more testing then on Windows 10? That's kind of surprising. Well, because remember, they weren't going to introduce any new features. Oh, there was that's a, right. right. When, once they introduced the end of support date, they kind mm -hmm. of said, look, we're we're going to just keep supporting this version of Windows 10 now, and we're not going to add any new they That one they actually came out and said publicly. Like, this wasn't just a random guy saying it. it was Microsoft, this was policy. Yeah. And uh, I look. Yeah. So I they're playing know. chicken I, with their users. I mean, this, this happens I, it's a, a lot. game. It is a game. It, there are no winners. It's yeah. a weird game. It's uh, yeah. they should no just no winners, really only winners. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In the um, end, the cash cow is still the enterprise, and if the right yeah. enterprise customer says, "Oh, we'll be staying on ten, we'll be right. staying on um, ten, and we know, expect sports, traffic, and finance cards on the lock screen," be a shame yeah. if I something do, happened to all I, this business you're getting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. It is that kind of a relationship. Um, it's it's. I feel like we always find out in the end why things happen, but they're always confusing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that changed between Windows 10 and 11 is that Microsoft stopped syncing your desktop wallpaper when you signed in with a Microsoft account or a corporate account. And um, on the face of things, that doesn't make a lot of sense. That, that was probably the number one request for sync, you know, that uh, as a user... When you go to a new device, you have this familiar experience because there's your wallpaper and your color scheme and all that stuff. And then what I learned years later was that um, there was a big corporate customer who switched between Dell and uh, PCs and went to HP. And when they synced everyone up, they had Dell wallpapers. And uh, HP called Microsoft and said, turn that off now. <laughs> and they did. They got rid of it. Yeah, good. Yeah. I mean, that, but, but, you know, so... That's, yeah, Retroactively, that. you can kind of look at something and say, okay, I, I, I don't agree with it necessarily, but I, okay, that makes sense. Um, maybe that's a, that's kind of a, 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 <laughs> a blunt way of, you know, fixing a problem, I guess. I mean, it seems like you could put a little policy there or something, but whatever. Okay. Um, but yeah, so Windows 10 is, is now an ongoing concern again. And I think it's tied to Copilot. I, I, I think the, I think Microsoft really did for 10 seconds and tend not to update Windows 10 ever again. But then they realized, hey, wait a minute, we got to get Copilot out in the world. And if we tie it to Windows 11 version, da, 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 whatever, no one's going to upgrade. And oh, by the way, what about Windows 10? We got to get it over there, too. And that was the end of that policy. I think they just said, we're just going to we're going to get this out to everybody. And that's how we're going to do it. So now we're testing minor features. But um, but, you know. Not to dredge up speaking of PTSD Windows Phone, but I mean, Windows uh, or live tiles made sense on a phone. This at a glance thing made sense. We, we were always looking at our phone. We can find out things without having to dive into apps. That made sense. They brought live tiles to Windows and it never made sense, right? Like we don't use our PCs that same way. And putting these types of things on a lock screen is very similar. You know, I don't think that people walk up to their computer, wake it up, look at the lock screen and go, yeah, no, I don't need to use it anymore. I know what the weather is. You know, I, I just don't, I just don't see the value in this personally. I just, but I love the ADD effect, you know, that, that started back at Win8. It's like, click me. No, click me. Look, yeah, I'm twitching yeah. the most. Click me. Well, this is like, but yes, there was, there was a lot of bumping and bobbing and that kind of stuff, animations and whatever. But, you know, then they move it to a back to a start menu, and now we have live tiles on an interface that's never on screen all the time. And it's like, guys, <laughs> you know, think about it. No, what are you going to do? I want to know what the weather is, so I'm going to do Windows key plus L to lock the computer. Look at the lock screen and say, now I know what the weather is, and then I'm going to type in my pin or password, however I sign in. You know, I I just don't. This is I don't know what this is. Is it was it college intern week at Microsoft last week or something? I have no you idea. You know that was my first thought when I saw this. It's like oop, yeah. the intern got loose. They wouldn't <laughs> let him work on eleven, so they let him work on ten. Yeah. <laughs> so at the time I wrote these notes, which was about ten minutes ago, um, there were no new builds, but now there are, and uh, <laughs> there was a. <laughs> You know, <laughs> they're doing things on Wednesdays, like I said. So uh, Canary and Dev, again, on the same build. And there are two uh, changes. And one of them has to do with low vision users. So that's just a, a temporary setback. There was a um, a pointer indicator accessibility setting for low vision users that they've disabled temporarily because it's too buggy. And then there's some, uh, in the same vein, in some ways, um, there are assistive 
uh, there are Bluetooth based assistive hearing device capabilities that are now available. <laughs> so I guess we've gone from one accessibility feature to the other. Um, and then some other bugs related to shutdown, hibernation, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, the problems that have dog windows ever since there's been something called windows. Um, I'm pretty sure that the phrase hot bagging exists solely because windows is a thing. Um, but yeah, so I guess we're still dealing with that kind of stuff. And that's it. Uh, we, this is uh, wow. That's the quickest not, Windows section I, I think we've had in a while. I, I know we we will we, we'll dive I, in we, and out of Windows a little bit uh, as we go forward. But yeah, that's it. There really, really is a case cool. to be moving to Thursday if they're going to keep releasing on Wednesday. <laughs> I mean, really, Richard's like, listen, I mean, Thursday. Mm, It'll have saying, to be before like, my show because I've got Tech News Weekly on Thursdays already. You so. can you can move to Wednesday, yeah, Micah. We'll swap. We'll oh, do we some swap. swap. Oh, we can swap. I don't. Yeah. I have. I mentioned how much I hate change. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to mention it, Paul. You exude. <laughs> Is it obvious? Oh, I'm sorry. It's obvious. <laughs> Do I have a? I actually have a tattoo. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> might as well. It's your aura. Most it just says change with auras. a circle. Yeah, and a yours line is through just it. like your aura just says don't change. <laughs> you know how I feel about this. <laughs> now, the, it, it, the IT saying is change is good. You go first. Ooh, yeah, I like exactly. That. I like that. Mm -hmm. Um, well, then let's move into Microsoft 365, uh, given that yeah. that's the new hotness anyway. <laughs> as, as <Richard> says. <laughs> right. It's well, it is the yeah, it's the I mean, it's micro uh, Windows is technically within Microsoft 365 now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's, it's a great point, Uber. right? That right? that Windows had to grow join another group to, to be relevant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, eventually they'll just hand off Windows to the part of the company that makes like Furbies or whatever little, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what do you call those things? Plush mallows or whatever. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, squish mallows, squish whatever mallows, they're called. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin knew. It'll be, it'll be the yeah. intern center. Right. The intern center. <laughs> yes, right. Right. <laughs> it's like, you're only going to be here three months, so we're going to make you work on Windows. I, this isn't the Microsoft campus. This is the college campus. Shut up. You're working on Windows. <laughs> okay. Um, Everybody has to pay their dues. You yeah. will deploy something into Windows. Yeah, right. Um, the bar is low. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the big controversies, I guess, uh, is Microsoft moved from kind of perpetual office to the subscriptions with Office 365 and now Microsoft 365 is that there were obviously customers that don't want any part of that. And so Microsoft has, they've always, they've been pretty consistent about this. We're, we're going to have this, what they call the perpetual versions of Office. These are the versions that you buy outright. You own them. They, you know, they have a support life cycle. You can install them on multiple computers. In recent years, they've made them less desirable, but not by not updating them with new features over time. Although, I, you know, some people might argue that's a benefit. Mm, um, I think some customers demanded that. So yeah. Stop moving things. Yeah. Because they hate um, change. Well, yeah, because they hate change. I, no, I get it. Um, when you're an IT guy, every one of those changes gets turned into support tickets. Right. Yeah. Yep. Right. And so it's just, it's money, right? You know what your average I, cost per ticket is. Yeah. And so you know how many you get in. It's like, yeah, you just cost me 20 grand. I feel it, but I, I hear you. I mean, you're right. I'm not disagreeing. But I, on the other hand, I, I, one of the things that Microsoft did that sort of infamously was, uh, this was probably post uh, Office 95, Office 2000, no, 97 maybe, whatever year it was, um, was they they worked to make all the toolbars on each Office app be as familiar or as similar as possible. The idea being that somehow if you were a um, like a word user, you could pick up Excel and because most of the toolbars were the same, you'd be like, oh, I can use this product, you know. Um, and what they really found, and there was no, there was no actual user testing or any research that uh, really, it just sounded right, you know. Hmm. And what we found is that you know people adapt. You know, you can use this kind of complicated UI in Windows, and then use an Android phone or an iPhone or an iPad or something, and they don't work in a similar way at all. And you just, you just, it's fine. You know, it just works fine. So I don't know what the real training costs are moving between Office. 2019 or whatever it is in office 2024 which is the next version or whatever i don't know are they really yeah. that i don't know i really don't know but well, and you use that anyway, as a yes. support ticket number to figure out how much you're going to spend on trading yeah, yeah right so 
uh, Mike, look, uh, whatever the reason, Microsoft's customers have demanded these perpetual things uh, persist, and they do, right? And so I, I think we've all suspiciously wondered when, you know, when are they going to cut it off? You know, it's coming. You know, this is the last one, but they've sort of sold it along. Like 2019 came and went, 20, uh, 2021 is the current version. They announced this past week there will be a 2024, right? And there will, in fact, be a long-term servicing channel version of uh, Office 2024. Um, so uh, how long you know, is long now? Yeah, uh, five minutes. Um, no, no. no, I don't. <laughs> I think the. <laughs> I think they're both. I think they're both five years. years. Okay, where yeah. they used to be ten. Ten years. And in right. dev now, you can't get anything over three. Yeah. Yeah. I. Oh, okay, five. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, it's welcome to twenty twenty four. I don't know. So the big change this year, or for this version of the product, is that Microsoft now has Copilot, right? So they have these co-pilot capabilities. It's not so much that they're adding new features every single month, although yes, they are, but rather that those a lot of those new features are now part of co-pilot, which is this added subscription thing. And in the case of Copilot Pro and Copilot for Microsoft 365, you get these capabilities in the Microsoft desktop apps, web apps, probably mobile apps eventually, that you just you don't get if you don't pay for that subscription, regardless of the fact that you might have a Microsoft 365 subscription. So these perpetual versions of the product will not support that. Um, you couldn't just buy Office 2024 and then pay for a Copilot Pro subscription, let's say, and get the additional functionality from Copilot. Now, I know what some people are thinking. They're smiling and saying, good, I don't want Copilot. I love that there's a version of Office that doesn't have Copilot. And actually, I got to be honest, I hear you. <laughs> because um, in the same way that Office, uh, I use Word primarily, like Word on Windows kind of badgers you with these little pop-up banners if you don't uh, use OneDrive or save things in a certain way or blah, 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 whatever. Uh, Office on the Mac, Micah, you may have seen this, mm -hmm. uh, has, well, actually you may not because you probably don't pay for it, I guess. But if you pay for Copilot, Copilot appears in the middle of the screen every time you start a document. You can't turn this off. Oh, mm -hmm. that's and frustrating. Like, you've got to be kidding me. So the is every I, I've configured this app how I want it. It doesn't go to some template thing. It goes right into a new document. I can save to the desktop. It does not badger me about that. But it does put up a copilot thing right in the beginning, right in the middle of the screen that I have to you know click. And I, I think you can hit escape probably and get rid of it. But you it you it's cannot. Still there, there is right. It, you can't. There just is say, no Don't feature. There's yeah. there's no way to turn. Yeah. yeah. All modal so, dialogues are evil. Right. Like the bottom. I think, yeah, I think part of it is fixed. honestly just the newness of it. I think they wanted to rush yeah. it out, get it out there. And that as people yeah. provide feedback, they'll be like, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. call it yeah. Dell wallpaper, right? Like that's <laughs> it's yeah. the well, Dell wallpaper. They have Dell wallpaper. It. There's an <laughs> argument to be made too. People will complain about discoverability of new features in, in the opposite sense that, you know, you, yeah. you didn't yep. know they were there and you go find them. Uh, so yeah, hopefully, like you're saying, Paul, it's a temporary thing where eventually, well, but it'll get. So you've inside. just described a problem that's already been solved, which is yes, I I I respect Microsoft's desire and need to allow people to discover this feature, but it also should have a button that says, "Don't yeah. ever show me this again." Yeah, <laughs> Listen, I have discovered yeah. it and I have found it wanting. I get got it. Lost. Yes, I I see what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. Don't feature. ever show me that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they, they don't do it. And they don't do it on Windows either. So you can always tell when there's sysadmins in the room and they're announcing a new feature because the very first question out of every admin's mouth is how off. do I turn it off? What happens yeah, if I'm you sure. ask it? How do I make you go away? <laughs> well, forever. what I did is I asked Google, <laughs> and as it turns out, there is no way to turn this off. So and I've looked through the UI and you know. On on the flip side, by the way, uh just word Windows or Mac, um, there is a very prominent co-pilot button that appears now. And in Windows, at least, there's a pane that can appear. Um, I like to turn off the ribbon, right? But there's something called, I think it's called the quick access toolbar, if I'm not mistaken, and you can add your little buttons to it. Um, there's no way to add the co-pilot button to that, right? So I would want to turn off the ribbon, basically hide the ribbon. But I would put the co-pilot button up there because actually sometimes I That's would like to use it. That's a good place for it, yeah. Uh, and they don't offer that. And again, I, I think these are tied to the same bit of, immaturity it's just this thing just arrived they wanted to get it out quickly they haven't maybe thought uh, thought through all the use cases and um, hopefully both those things will occur i want to add it here and i want to take it away here you know I, I want this thing to work the way i want it to work which i guess was what i spent an hour on last week so i'll move on um <laughs> <laughs> anywho so uh office perpetual 2024 you're not getting ai 
Um, I'd sort of just mentioned this in passing, but I, I guess this is, oh, this is the web app. So that's why I'm sorry. So Microsoft 365 has supported a co-pilot, right, for some time. If you have those apps, desktop apps, uh, Windows or Mac, I guess, because I have Copilot Pro, you also get those capabilities. But now they they work on the web apps as well. So in other words, you're paying for a Microsoft 365 subscription of any kind or not, actually, right? Because you could use those for free. No, you have to, but you have to have one to get the other subscription. Sorry, I'm forgetting things here. But anyway, the point is you can now access the uh, Copilot capabilities in the primary uh, office web apps, as we used to call them, um, if you have a Copilot Pro subscription as well, right? So in the past, you needed a Copilot for Microsoft 365, I guess, but now it also works with the Copilot Pro. And if that doesn't make sense, what I just said, that's because you speak English and I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's confusing. Mm. But this is that matrix of features things I was talking about, right? Um, it's hard enough in uh, an app like Word, which is available in multiple places, right? Mobile, different mobile apps, different you know, iPad apps and Word, I'm sorry, uh, Windows and Mac and the web. And and one day, randomly, they add some fee. I used the transcription uh, example two, two, three years ago, added it to the web version. Uh, that thing didn't come to Windows for at least two years, you know? And uh, you can create a matrix of like, here are all the features in this one product where do they appear? And this is an example of that with AI and Copilot, because I believe that the web apps for Microsoft 365 supported Copilot if you paid for Copilot for Microsoft 365. And now they support Copilot Pro as well. So you can check that little box off in the matrix and uh, maybe you sunk my battleship. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, com it's complicated, right? And... On the free side, this one's confusing because they didn't really announce it, although a guy who works on the team did on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it, the century. Um, Microsoft, uh, when they, had, I think it was when they released Copilot Pro, uh, made a, a slider available in Copilot for Chat GPT 4 and Chat GPT 4 Turbo. Um, now that Chat GPT, GPT 4 Turbo is available, or non-paying users. So if you just go to copilot.microsoft.com or copilot in Windows 10, presumably, or copilot in the Edge sidebar, presumably. I have to say presumably because no one's ever announced these things and there's no way to actually know. But there is, um, they're just using chat GPT-4 Turbo by default. So uh, it's a little, it's more up to date, which is important for certain types of queries as I think of them or prompts or whatever. Um, this guy said there would be a switch, which I actually haven't. Well, I see because I'm, you know, I'm paying for it, right? Mm. Um, but I don't believe people have seen yet. And then I guess it only appears in certain <laughs> cases. So, you know, they have, uh, they don't use this term, but personalities or whatever, where it can be uh, creative or balanced or precise, right? Um, if you want it uh, balanced, I, I, I think it's balanced and creative or probably GPT-4 Turbo and precise is GPT-4 or something like that. Or, you know, the, it, it will switch between the models based on various conditions and then sometimes probably switch back to uh, uh, one of the other based on usage maybe. But I, I think the primary advantage of GPT-4 for Microsoft, uh, Turbo rather, for Microsoft is that it's uh, less expensive to run. <laughs> so I think that was a big part of moving it down to um, the non-paying customers. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 The, and you're also seeing they're getting some new computational efficiencies. So, yeah, I think they, they're, they you, you hit it on the head. It's all a cost control thing. Like, I'm already collecting yeah. your money now. So I, I want to spend as little as I can on that while still staying right. ahead. So it's that balancing act. There was talk early on, too, about uh, complaints. I remember surrounding ChatGPT4 becoming lazy, uh, which yes. at the time was an a suggestion that it was not answering prompts as often and, and sometimes just outright saying that it wouldn't answer them and that turbo was supposed to help correct that. So it certainly gives, uh, it gives a better understanding of why maybe they chose that name, uh, along with, as you're saying that the performance yeah. uh, nature of, of chat GPT for turbo. I'll see that sometimes, you know, you type in something and says, yeah, I'm sorry, we can't do that. I'm like, yeah, you can. I'm you totally this. can. Uh, we try, know you can. <laughs> let's try it again. I, I, I believe in you. Yeah, um, there you go. <laughs> it's going to be all um, right. You can do it. I assume, Richard, this has been a big thing in your world. And yes. I, I have to say, I, I have not been 
I have not been pushed hard on something like this in the enterprise side of things in a long time. I have to go back to my days at Windows IT Pro, mm -hmm. but I, I, Google has reached out to me multiple times about this. Amazon did recently where there's this other battleground occurring in the EU around big tech, aside from all the stuff we know about, like mm -hmm. Apple app stores and the gatekeeper stuff and all that. And it, it, it really is just a long, uh, a long-term issue in, in Europe around data sovereignty and uh, sovereignty, sovereign, 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 so, sovereignty, sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Sovereignty. There you go. There we go. Uh, I don't understand English either. And uh, data privacy and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, these cloud vendors over the years have worked to make sure that people can keep their data within their region or within their country, yada, yada, yada. So the new the new battle is, well, there's two, the twofold. There's the licensing practice by which Microsoft makes it difficult, allegedly, to move customers between different clouds, right? They want to keep you in Azure. And a big part of that is this thing called egress fees. The idea is that I'm ready to leave, or at least I want to leave partially. I want to move some of my data to one of the other clouds. And um, I, I think really because of regulatory pressure, Google and AWS over time agreed to end those fees, right? Um, and they've been calling on Microsoft very vocally <laughs> um, to do the same. And Microsoft has resisted. Actually, Google, uh, Amazon resisted for a while too. If my memory mm -hmm. serves, Google did this in January. AWS did it about 10 seconds ago. So Microsoft just did it too. <laughs> so it, it was, but, that's the rough timing. And it's because they were headed towards legislation and they didn't want the They were going to, yes, they were going to be slapped down. Yep. It's not yep. just moving between clouds. It's also what they're calling repatriation. Yeah. Oh. So as people right. are moving, In other words, yeah, make sure the data comes out of a, a particular locale and yeah. gets back to. Oh, I'm going to put it, I want to move it back on-prem because it's costing yeah. me too much in the cloud. Right. which may be, you know, your fault or their fault. Like there's a whole debate here of this lift and shift that happened over the pandemic, yeah. is, which has now turned into a bunch of monthly bills that continue to grow. And so CFOs are sort of pushing back. And in, and one of the solutions, rather than re-architecting your software to be more efficient in the cloud, is just <laughs> ship it home. Right. But then you look at the egress fees and say, this is a barrier to that. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, that's just wrong. Let's see if we can get legislation to knock it out. And uh, which clearly was happening. So, you know, it's not right. a bad, the, there is no excuse for egress fees, really. Yeah, right. hundred percent. Yeah. Predatory. I mean, yeah. I, I think. And, I, unless you're going to put in ingress fees, you know, <laughs> yeah. at least make it cost you go in and cost you go out. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Ingress fees. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is uh, the, everyone else is doing it. Uh, defense is pretty common in big tech. I think that explains app store fees actually. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it also explains yeah. charging for luggage right like yeah. there's and, and fuel surcharges and like it, it it's a kind of pseudo monopolistic practice well everybody else is doing it so we get to do it too yeah i mean that was also there was an economist who argued that uh it wasn't any lack of profit on big tech's mm -hmm. side that resulted in the mass layoffs that took place but more it was right. shaped by that herd mentality that you mm -hmm. saw one company do it so you did it too and it right. was it was two things one that herd mentality I mean, but also uh then it brought those uh companies up in terms of the investors who were going "Ooh, you're costing yeah. less money so this is great yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a, it was a cheap world. way to get a share a stock bump at a time when you didn't have a lot of new product to stock and talk about yeah yep. i mean i i can't prove the second half of it but the notion mm -hmm. that uh these guys were not suffering from a profit or revenue perspective is easily proven one <laughs> you know? banner quarter that's, that's after fact. another mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yep Yep. One banner quarter, just one right after the other. Yep. <sighs> yeah. Well, yeah. Let's take another quick pause mm -hmm. <sighs> as we come back with AI next. All right. We are back with Windows Weekly, the show where we talk to two of the foremost Windows veterans. It is Paul Therott, Richard Campbell. And I joined the two of them, Micah Sargent, uh, as we continue on in the coverage of what's up at Microsoft and, well, the surrounding uh, companies as well. Because I believe we start by talking yes. about Apple. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm trying to shift the focus of the show a little bit to Apple. So this is just, I'm just <laughs> oh, no, testing the waters. Just stopped listening. <laughs> no, there, Come back. What? There is a, there, there's a Microsoft angle to this. But honestly, there's also a common sense angle to this because... Uh, I think it was Mark Gurman broke the story. The New York Times has since, um, I guess, confirmed it. But 
uh, Apple looked at partnering with OpenAI and now are very deep into talks with Google to partner with them to bring Gemini to the iPhone and use that to power a lot of their generative AI experiences that will come in uh, that next version of iOS um, this fall. So we're probably going to learn about whatever they do at WWDC whenever that is in June. And then they'll start releasing new products and, and the new versions of the OS in the fall. And look, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't exactly have two feet in the Apple ecosystem, but you don't have to be paying too much attention to hear the outrage and shock that these two companies, which allegedly hate each other, would partner on this kind of a thing. Um, and I, I had a different reaction to this, which was, I don't think you guys are paying attention. Um, mm. You know, Apple has actually a very rich history of partnering at, uh, for this kind of a product launch. Um, they have a rich history of getting rid of their partners as quickly as possible, too. But um, this, this, we've seen this story before, right? I mean, um, this notion that uh, you would partner with uh, uh, like an enemy, essentially, right? That they would betray you, <laughs> you know? And then um, you would sue them and, or sue somebody, I guess. This public bitterness. You know, you talk about destroying each other and then there's a reunion at the end yeah. is what happened with Apple and Microsoft when Microsoft helped Apple create part of the original Mac UI and then created Windows and they sued and blah, 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 whatever. And then Apple needed Microsoft again in 1997 to keep making Office and help rescue the company financially and blah. We all know that story, right? But the other thing is with Google and Apple specifically, I don't think people understand the dynamic there. I mean, everyone remembers the Steve Jobs, I'm going to go thermonuclear war and destroy this company because Android is a stolen product, right? But I hope we also remember that they never actually sued Google, right? I mean, no. they went after, you know, Samsung, which is a crappy company that absolutely copied the uh, the design of various iPhones. And uh, and that wound its way down. I mean, it, they, they, that didn't won, work out well either, you know? But they didn't, yeah, they didn't get much out of it. But the real story there is that for all the posturing, for all of the we made Apple Maps and now we're coming after search kind of stuff that we hear about. Um, these guys have the most lucrative partnership in big tech today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Google paid Apple as much as 20 something billion dollars last year to keep search on the iPhone as the default. And that's only 36% of the revenues that they made from it. Yeah. This is a partnership that benefits both of them. Of course, these two guys going to partner on this it's the same exact thing well and, um, and tim cook's no dummy yeah. somebody's done the numbers on what they were going to have to build oh up infrastructure yes. to run their own large language yep. models and he went yep Google's let's let Google somebody do that with. how does that yeah. sound yeah well and google needs the data which is why they, the search thing works too like it's all mutually beneficial yes the, there's the, there are other ways that apple and google kind of co-benefit each other that are a little less direct you know for example i mentioned in passing this app store thing um you know google uh, apple arbitrarily does whatever they do with the app store but then google just copies them like 100 mm -hmm. and it gives them both that well the other guy's doing it <laughs> you know like they they I, I mean they must be doing it for a reason i you know i it's the same reason we're doing it you know like i i, I think th there's a strategy there and uh, yes, I mean, Apple, pr you know, uh, promotes itself on privacy and blah, 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 whatever. But the fact remains, I mean, Google search is the default and it's not staying on your iPhone. I'm sorry. Right. Like exactly. if, unless you're, I, I'm sorry, it's just not like uh, that's, that's the biggest marketing nonsense of all time. So mm -hmm. these are two big, horrible companies like Microsoft, like Amazon, like all these other guys, they're all horrible. And um, I think, you know, we need to get past these kind of uh mythological immature ideals that we think this you know that somehow one of these companies is like better than the other you know and i felt for that i listen i'm human too like i i thought that microsoft under satch and adela was some kind of ethical higher ground something something and that is not the case <laughs> it just isn't you know so i i this is maybe a growth moment for all of us but um these guys partnering on gemini uh, to, for the iphone to me makes sense and apple being apple will market it appropriately and and we'll probably take very real steps to contort it in some way that it makes sense for iPhone and for iPhone users, right? Yeah, sure. And they'll, if you they'll, uh, they'll amplify it, that's it. They'll amplify it. Yeah, but it also yeah. doesn't preclude them making a deal with Microsoft sometime in the future. Yes, I, and I that's can't blame the, Microsoft that, for not wanting to be in on this one. That's because, the angle that kind of bugs me. I yeah. when I look at big tech companies, I made this case about Apple and I'm sorry about Google and Microsoft. You know hating each other and when they should be in fact standing with each other against apple 
I mean, you can make that case with uh, Apple and Microsoft too. Apple yeah. relies on uh, Microsoft Office still to some degree. It's mm -hmm. still an important part of their marketing, right? Uh, it, you know, it runs on the Mac, you know, by the way, it runs on the iPhone. Um, I, well, and they can and be all a of these things happen, to stand right? up against Google. Yeah, Microsoft and Google partnered to push Safari to be compliant with the WebAssembly standards. Like this does yeah. happen. They all play this dance. Yeah. Protecting each their various markets while and you know, trying to limit the other guy and making sure they get to play on uh, in certain other spaces. I I wouldn't want to take on Apple's LLM right. workload right now. Right. Because you right. know by the oh way God, they control yes. their customers, they're gonna get nailed. I, and there is an example from history of that. Think mm -hmm. back to uh, Singular, or I guess it was AT&T by that point. Yeah, look what happened to AT&T. Uh, the iPhone, even the small number of iPhone users that were there that first year brought that network to its knees. To and its they were knees. just on 2G, yeah. you know, or 2.5. What was it called? Edge yeah. or whatever. Um, yeah, that was that was a huge problem. And yeah. uh, a lot well, of those Microsoft company, is onboarding, co, you know, M365 Copilot people as fast as they can. You're, yeah. They're consuming enough of their own resources. This is so, not the time to introduce a right. network workload. It raises the specter that maybe they did ask Microsoft. And Microsoft's <laughs> like, yeah, we can't do that. Like, yeah, I, it's we, like, we, call we're us in out. a couple like, of years. Yep, we're done. Yeah. But I do like the idea of Apple or any other company, but Apple especially, I think, because of the way they kind of market their stuff is uh, uh, taking the best from whatever's out there and, and, sure. and making this thing for iPhone users that is more um bespoke you know or whatever we call well, it I, bespoke ai yeah you know? especially and if i'm a real go ahead Rocky. i was just going to say especially the from from my understanding of of how they're kind of partnering with google uh and forgive me if you, if you did mention this part it is th they're doing as much of the stuff that they can do or that i should say that it can do that apple can do on device, on with device, its own exactly. AI stuff, and then yep. what it can't do, it's farming it out to Google. Well, in according to all of this, and I, I find that interesting. I, you know what I, what's going to be done locally versus what they will use Google yes. potentially for. So this hasn't come up recently, but and maybe this wasn't something we discussed while you were on the show. But uh, I have raised this idea in the past. I mean, honestly, Apple's biggest contribution to the AI space to date has been this notion of doing as much as you can on the device. Mm -hmm. And that thing has been, that's been copied by other companies on other platforms. And I do think in the, it be, because of the expense of this cloud-based AI, that we generative AI, that some combination of on device and in the cloud is in some ways, this optimal kind of hybrid configuration. And I think I, I don't thank Apple for that or whatever. I mean, Apple did it for its own reasons. Right, and exactly. To, uh, you know, I, and it's and for it, and to address its own limitations exactly. or whatever, but but they some insight came out of that, and I think there, I think that's the thing we all accept. We, we're trying to figure out what AI looks like with an MPU on a PC right now. We just mentioned this briefly. You know, um, we're trying to make that model make sense. You know, on the PC, we just don't. It's easy on a phone, I think, because you have these use cases where you're like, yes, I would like to remove that person from the back of the photo, or whatever it might be, or, you know, some speech translation thing or whatever it might be. Like there are certain things that just, because your phone is in your pocket all the time, you always have, like, it makes sense to, you know, have stuff that works on the device, right? It, it's not always a good idea to go to the cloud for everything because you don't always have good connectivity. Like you want that experience to be consistently good or whatever. So I like, whatever, I, I think we should credit Apple for that. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, yeah. So we know that uh, Build is in May. We know now that Google I.O. is also in May, May 14. Uh, and we know Apple WWC is always in June. They haven't announced the show yet, but they will soon. And this is the same every spring as developer show season, right? You know, I.O., Build, uh, Google, or uh, WWC back to back. And you could expect all of these shows to be all AI all the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. It has, no over, it. it has overwhelmed the conversation for better or worse. Yes, it has. Yep. Yeah, I had some, uh, so, you know, Apple uh, for, you know, several years probably has been marketing what we now think of as AI capabilities on its phones as they would talk about machine learning, right? That was kind of the way they would describe it. And today the conversation has shifted to uh, generative AI or just like, you know, people say AI or whatever. And, you know, Apple's on board, right? I mean, they, they announced that new, I, uh, what do you call it, MacBook Air 
And uh, it is the AI PC. <laughs> it's like, yikes, guys, seriously. Like, mm -hmm. but, but you know what? Whatever. That's the language you're using. It's fine. Um, and I, I do think that this stuff, uh, these developer shows, uh, there, there will be other AI capabilities, obviously. But I, I think for end user benefit, the thing that people kind of understand is what we would call generative AI, right? I think this is the, the biggest, this is what Absolutely. chat GPT is, right? Yeah, it's the, generative it, AI is, over the, the, the stuff that is so far in the background. You know, we talk about yeah. at, the, at the chip level, some of the decisions, so to speak, that the chip is making. Yeah. There's AI packed in there. There's the AI the technically oh God, AI that helps sort a dog AI from a spell cat. Checking. From, yeah, there's AI you know, spell, grammar exactly. checking. Exactly. It's all it's of everywhere. that. But yeah, the, yeah. the AI that they're trying to market now, as you say, is gen AI or generative AI for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's the big push this year. So I think I, 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 we're going to see a lot of that. I mean, there'll be, there will be, obviously there always is. I mean, how long has they, Apple had something that I'm sure is called AI kit, right? They have this. I assume they do, right? AI mm -hmm. kit. That must be a thing. No, I should be. It's, it yeah. will be. If it isn't, like, it will be. Like VR kit, only different. Yeah. Uh, you, you know You know they're going to have it if they think, don't already. I think right? it's but ML. Like, that's why. Because the, the, the way ML, yeah. oh, that's why. They're going to change it because that's yeah. a terrible name. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, anyway. Um, and then uh, tomorrow, speaking of bad timing, uh, Microsoft is hosting an AI and Surface event. Uh, and then now we know they're hosting another one in May, <laughs> right before it builds. So our best guess for now is that... Uh, the one that's happening tomorrow is kind of business focus. And uh, we've heard rumors of, uh, you know, Qualcomm based computers coming, the new ones, right? Based on the Elite X uh, chipset. And that must be May. And I guess that's how we're splitting things up. So we'll see what happens. This, I mean, I can see doing tomorrow. this ahead of Google I.O. to try and beat messaging on Google I.O. Yeah, but, but, it's, if, but if you're doing it after Google I.O., like, do to build. Like, what is this? The, the event tomorrow, you mean? No, no, the event in May. In May. So when is, what build is after IO, isn't it? It or is. is it? No, yeah. it's after. It's, it is the week so of May 20th. So maybe this is actually going to be a build. I think it's right before, I think it's right on the, um, I'm sure what it is, is there's like a private event before build, I think. And then they'll, yeah, maybe that's I, they'll it. probably build it'll be part of the day. keynote. Yeah. Yeah. So there'll yeah. probably be some overlap on the two, but they'll do some. So I, I mean, I, the expectation, the rumors are that we're going to get, uh, you know, business surface devices tomorrow and then consumer devices in May. It's and weird. Yeah. And they've talked about Intel on one side and Qualcomm on the other, right? And mm -hmm. I is is it possible that the year of the ARM PC will happen before the year of desktop Linux? We'll, we're going to find out. I don't know. Well, they if they announce ARM hardware just before build, then build needs to be about ARM hardware. Yeah. Right? Because it's right. going to be devs that are going to make that work. That's my guess. I mean, that's based on rumors, right? I mean, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. So we shall see. So we got those to look forward to. Uh, and then, you know, six days later when it's not even fresh anymore, we'll talk about it on Windows Week. <laughs> 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 because fantastic. Um, all right, what else we got here? So in, apparently NVIDIA now has a developer show every year. I don't know if you saw already the clips from this, but... Uh, it was quite the rock show, wasn't it? Yep. We well, covered, that's what he said. He goes, I don't know if you guys events. thought you were at a like a Taylor Swift concert or something, but uh, this is a developer show. <laughs> yeah, Jeff <laughs> Jarvis know? and I covered the event live. Um, okay. Yeah. And yes, it was, yeah, it, exactly mm. what you said. Um, it was a... <laughs> it's funny. It was it's in rock show very, vibes. Um, very jargon heavy, very in-depth, very much... Uh, getting into the nitty gritty. And I, I found that interesting as someone who's used to more consumer facing uh, keynote presentations. Yeah. No, it, this was it almost had a win heck feel, right? Like once upon a time, Microsoft did events specifically for the driver right. and hardware builders. That's exactly right. And their keynotes were geeky. And yep. that this had that that buzz about it. It's like yeah. you need to be and in this know, space I, to be in this room. I, I just math. gave Apple... <laughs> I just gave Apple some credit for doing whatever they did, but I think we can blame Apple for this effect because Microsoft's developer shows, Microsoft's um, uh, Ignite, you know, show for IT pros, et cetera. The, if, if the keynote has turned into a marketing event on day one mm -hmm. uh, because of the success Apple's had doing the same thing. Um, it, you, my wife could watch a WWC uh, keynote and think nothing of it other than, oh my God, do these guys love Apple too much? What's happening? <laughs> right. But I mean, she wouldn't, feel out of place like it's not a it doesn't feel like a developer show that show is a developer show and there's lots of developer stuff that happens there but um 
yeah, I think that we might be looking at the, well, this isn't, you know, NVIDIA flexing their muscles on the one hand, but also, I, I mean, I, I kind of like the old school nature of what they're doing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I kind of miss this. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I also think I think they're a little panic struck to stay in front like these big yeah. water cooled units they're building. Right. That's uh, I don't have time to build a refined thing. So let's just <laughs> so put this force right. it. Right. Well, I thought right. it was a good remind. The company took the time to uh, do its, I think, a bit of a stage bow saying y'all have been yes. talking about all of this gen AI stuff and you're so excited about what uh, Microsoft is right. doing. And what We are making so much of the hardware that's already running that stuff. Yeah, that's and right. we're at the root of all of that. Don't forget us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I was, I did find it very inspirational to see mm -hmm. the CEO of a company clearly know yeah. so much about what the company is making. Like, he is, yes. that was yeah, cool. He's very technical. Yeah. He's a no, cool he's a guy. Proper engineer CEO. I, uh, there is still an element of they waltzed into this and he he tried to make the case like, oh, no, this is the strategy all along. And it's like, eh, you were making video yeah. cards computers. Yeah. I, like, I, I, you know, not really. Yeah. I'm just disappointed he didn't go with the liquid nitrogen additions. Like, <laughs> if you're going to go for it. Um, look, I God love him. I, and, and the harsh reality today and to keep bringing up the MPU thing is that. Um, all of the local AI, forget about the cloud for a moment. I mean, all of the local AI workloads that exist today are tuned for GPUs. So, I mean, I, maybe one day MPUs will be better at this and maybe it won't matter. I mean, well, maybe they're also the, just not that different, right? Like yeah, really, okay. they both scalar processors is not that big of a deal. Well, you know, we, we've already been harnessing GPUs through CUDA and the like to do other kind of scalar workloads like image recognition and things like this is not that weird. Right. So, you know, the, the joke has been, so what is your MPU? Like, why is that different from my GPU? Why do I need to buy something else? Because architecturally, it's just not that far I think apart. we can blame Apple for that again, because yeah. obviously you need another device. You need something to sell. That, right? <laughs> that's the strategy. And and Cook anyway. is, a, is a hardware guy. Yeah. Um, arguably, the MPU is simpler, right? Yes. Like, Scalar pipelines for for ray tracing are a complicated bit of kit, and what what NVIDIA has done is incredibly innovative. It's very very powerful, and you don't really need it if you're simply doing neural network work. Right. I I mean, Microsoft is doing everything they can to res re remove their dependency on NVIDIA right now. Right. Which oh yeah, is I know. They, 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 with the Cobalt processors and so forth. I mean, everybody's building their own hardware. Yeah. Um, which makes a lot of sense. Don't create a dependency where you don't need to. And, uh, and don't, you know, that trillion dollar valuation is cost for you. Like you, you right. go keep that money. Um, whether or not they can keep up is another question entirely. Like, I don't know how long Cobalt well, I mean, stay around. As a long-term Microsoft follower, I can tell you from experience that inertia is a wonderful thing from a business perspective. And, uh, Right now, NVIDIA is in a sweet spot. We don't know if this is the apex and they're on the way down or if this is still on the way up somehow. But um, the reality is, regardless of what happens going forward with whatever chipsets people or companies choose, whatever it is, um, they they built up enough capital and, and no, influence. You need to they, execute on it now. I, yeah. I would point out that um, clearly Jensen's paid for a stylist once. But his he's been using the same keynote outfit now for multiple shows. Like, oh, really? It's time to get another side. Oh, yeah. Now, the black T-shirt, black leather jacket thing, that's the same oh, look God. from Build last year. That's like, funny. Yeah. yeah. You, yep. you, you should update. You, if you <laughs> yes. actually want to level this up, like we talk about in this land of rock star CEOs, you should use the same look twice. Like there should be a stylist on call. It should I be think, a, a point. I, think, I mean, we have to blame Steve Jobs for this. No, no, yeah, <laughs> you the know? black turtle net and baggy and dad pant and dad jeans, like dad jeans. I would yeah. call them mum jeans, but yeah, fair enough. <laughs> it's whatever they were. Um, yeah, it's a look. You get a look. You know, I don't know. No, no, and I, I think this is very tech thing. It's like you paid for it once to create a look. You hung it up, and that you ordered seven of them. Exactly, you, hang them you in the ordered closet. seven of them. Right, right. <laughs> Unlike me, what I want our customers to do is upgrade all the time. I'm, I'm going to stick with the same. <laughs> me, thing. I've got fifteen of these jackets. Yeah. yeah, you just yeah, you open the closet, and it's just all this black it's, leather. It's just, yeah, know. it's just black t shirts Is this a dungeon, or what am I? What is this? Oh, this is your closet. <laughs> <laughs> is this a no. dungeon? Oh dear. <laughs>
Uh, well, anyway. Guthrie only wears a red polo shirt. Like, right, it's, it's, right. I'm not saying it's anything special to Jensen. Which is funny because like, if you see him out in the world and he's not wearing that, you know, he's like, uh, he's camouflaged. You don't even oh, yeah. notice him. He's almost unrecognizable. Yeah. That's, right. that's <laughs> the, the, the technique. There's a digression. I do me. enjoy that we spent more time on his clothing than we did on the products. But anyway, that's okay. Well, well don't worry. Products, they, <laughs> spent, they spent plenty of time on, on the product. Yeah. So. Yeah, and sure. the products are kicking it. Like, no, yep. no two ways about it. I hope they can keep up the rate of innovation. We will be better for it. Because yeah. what's happening in CPUs is not that exciting. We need to go to dedicated processing units for different workloads. Like, that's what makes sense in the evolution of, of the silicon at this point. So right. it is a good news. All right. What's next? Anyway. All righty. Uh, and then just random other generative AI things. You know, I, I saw this headline and I thought to myself, oh, I don't know if I want to write about this, but Google is adding generative AI to Fitbit. And I actually okay. looked into it by which I mean, I actually watched the event that made this reference. And I said, you know what? Actually, this makes sense. <laughs> so, well, if you, this makes sense in a lot of other things, this is where the way most Gen AI should be used, which is to make yes. existing products better. Yep. Well, but of course, see, this is health and fitness, right? So you want to be careful here. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, you don't want uh, an AI recommending uh, like a like a recipe thing could kill you, right? If you do yeah. it wrong, right? If they recommend the wrong things. Yeah. Um, but actually, if you think about how Fitbit works today, which is by measuring a lot of data and presenting charts and graphs and trends and things, mm -hmm. um, using generative AI to summarize that, maybe graph it or pre present it graphically and allowing you to ask questions of it. Uh, is very interesting. And actually, I, there was a line, uh, the woman who presented this at the Google event used a line that gave me an immediate flashback to the Microsoft Band, which uh, people watching the show might remember. Yes, and the original, and, and the original, miss. yep, the original promise of this device, which arrived at a time when uh, these wearables and, and the Apple Watch, I think it maybe had just come out or something, didn't have a lot in the way of sensors. And the idea of the Microsoft band was we're going to collect as much data as we can. It was like, it looked like the probe droid, no, the, um, what do you call that? Little uh, interrogator bot thing from the right. first Star Wars movie, you know, kind mm -hmm. of comes in on oh, Princess yes. Lee and it's got all these little needles and whatever. And the idea was we're going to grab as much as we can. At the time, it was a crazy amount of uh, sensors. Now today it's it's common, but back mm -hmm. then it was a big deal. And it was so ahead of us. And we're going to collect all this data and, and we're going to present you with this you know, information based on all the data, but the, the central, the promise, and they never fulfilled this was we as Microsoft have your, all of your work related info. So we have this stuff about your productivity and your kind of work day. And now we're collecting this data about your uh, health and, you know, health, well, we call it health data through a, a band. And we can actually put that together and say, Hey, you have this Monday morning meeting every, every week and you, your, your heart rate, resting heart rate goes to the roof 30 minutes before that meeting. So we're going to recommend that you, uh, you know, do meditation or do something to calm down, maybe stop drinking so much coffee, whatever it might be. And I was like, you know, that sounds, that sounds like a really neat idea. Now they never did this. <laughs> that never happened. Uh, they did almost nothing with any of that data. And uh, Microsoft Band came and went, right? They made a second version. They started making a third version that got canceled. It's gone. So whatever, we have Apple Watches and Fitbits now. But they basically were saying the same thing in the uh, Google Health event where, you know, that Fitbit could, you know, by collecting this information and based on Gemini and yada, yada, all that stuff, that they could offer you some prescriptive um, kind of, uh, was it holistic or heterogeneous data analysis and say, you know, You've got the same that Google today has all that information too, right? Um, your Windows Weekly starting in 15 minutes and your heart rate. It's, it's almost like you fall asleep, Paul. Like you, you're the opposite of a heart attack. You, <laughs> you know, no, or whatever it is. You might want to jog in place for a few minutes, you know, get become a little lively or something, whatever it is. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And I, cool. I, and I, yeah, it always, yeah, that seems like a good idea. They're, they're very careful to say, look, wait. We're not prescribing anything. We're not, you know, but they're already really doing this kind of thing in Fitbit. This is just kind of taking it to the next level. And I think it is a good use for generative AI because this is one of the things it does well, summarize data, right? Yeah. Or pull out key points from exactly. a big and body of data. Right? I'm tracking, I track a bunch of this stuff that I, a bunch of my health stuff. And that is something that I would like to see more of, yeah. more use of all of that information because right. I've got, you know, my body temperature, how it changes, plus my activity, plus my heart. I mean, 
this got is so much data and it only gives me right now i only have like trends oh you've walked right. up more flights of stairs this week than you normally do or your respiration rate is down i would love to have a more holistic understanding that i, I can be paired to get yes paired together. i think there's a where there's going to be an explosion a good kind of explosion of um, data related to things like glucose and blood pressure mm -hmm. and uh, combined with, you know, you have an iPhone and you're taking a picture of every meal and it can use AI to analyze it and figure out basically what it is and then kind of say, Hey, uh, you know, you, you eat this meal every Wednesday for some reason, stop doing that. Yeah. It's really bad. You're like, you, you know lose how much salt is days. in this? Yeah. Well, because you can, we, we can see it in the data. Like you, it takes you days to recover from this meal. Don't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you try that for a couple of weeks and they can say, all right, we got new data and you did it. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're, we're already seeing the trends are better for you. Right. Yeah. Um, I think and this is going to be a huge thing. And the other side of this is to do the um, PII safe cross comparisons. People in your age range and your lifestyle right. and so forth, you sit th in this location. You can improve this way. <laughs> yeah. Here's who's had the most, these are the person that have done the most success. I wonder if I can find this quickly. Probably not. But there's a thing somewhere in Fitbit that compares you to other people your age. And mm -hmm. in my case, I think it says it's like you. Most people your age are actually dead. Oh, so you're lovely. doing pretty good. Good. Uh, something like it's that. Like a I'm paraphrasing. Good job, Paul. Yeah, it's just you're a little still uh, like you're still alive. Like, you're, you're still you're you're, you still stood alive. upright today. That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know I don't know how you did it. Oh, Lord. So, in fact, we'd like to study you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of happening already. And then. Um, Less excitingly to me, uh, Amazon is, of course, using generative AI now for product page uh, creation for sellers, right? So if people sell things to the Amazon website, can use uh, generative AI to. Uh, that annoys me. I don't know what I'll to be do. To pro to, I know. Because, yeah, <laughs> basically they, they say, okay, I want to sell this thing and you can put in a yeah. little bit of information and then the thing does the rest. Right. Because what I don't, what I'm not annoyed by is the flip side of that. I have actually very much enjoyed the AI uh, generated Summer, summaries. The summaries, right? Like reviews. reviews. Yes, exactly. That's so I think this handy. is one of the greatest uses of AI. Yes. Yep. You see that in uh, Google Maps, I think, for reviews of places and mm -hmm. things. It's like people said. Dot, dot, dot. And it gives you like the top five, yes. whatever, comments so or whatever. Great? I love it's that. smart. I think it's good. Mm -hmm. I think it's good. But and these are this, sort of recommendation engine type things, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this feels like it's just going to be AI on both ends. And it's, it's like, almost what, like what this is a, maybe this? not a great. It's almost like an English as a second language thing, which is maybe not the oh, best way to I say Oh, I see what this, you're but, saying. But it feels like something. Yeah, it's, it, it doesn't. It's off. Like it just feels when off. You like it, you read it, it, it feels like, off. Yeah. And you, you showed somebody, you're like, does this read as English to you? Like, mm -hmm. does it make sense? I see the words, but do they go together in that yeah. the order but, or whatever? Does it look like it's been put together by a language model? It's Uncanny yeah, Valley. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. You're, you're absolutely maybe, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you a story that where the names will be left out because they will kill me. <laughs> but uh, literally a bitter, an ongoing bitter divorce where mm -hmm. they've been using chat TP, GPT to not speak. I told you to not to other. tell anyone about this. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's no, not you. <laughs> uh, to the point now where it, it both seems super uncanny valley, but at least one of them is now using chat GPT to de it to say what's oh, actually being go. said. No way. So oh, one yeah. of them's escalating it and the other one's de-escalating de it. escalating it. Fascinating to me. Isn't that something? What I like is that they're going to spend all this money on this. And then at the end, the AI is going to say, like, just split it 50-50. What's wrong? Right. With <laughs> well, and and, and in know? this case, it's really the judge. But the whole trick here is that everything <laughs> the judge is going to read has been prettified and, you know, de-hostilized. Wow. That's a word. Right. By chat. That is interesting. I, I yeah. want this to be. This a is case like, study. I, like, you, like, like, like you write study, something like, I think you are the biggest idiot I've ever met in the AI. Yeah. Is like you, you have some interesting ideas, <laughs> or like you, you have but a I unique have way of looking at this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. By which I mean you have the brain of an animal, um, you know, or whatever. But <laughs> you, yeah, you have the brain of a bucket of stones. <laughs> yeah, I've never thought of it that way because I'm educated. <laughs> uh, yeah, we just leave out the. Uh, Leave out the end of that, and then uh, it's polite. I've never yeah. thought of it that way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then I have a brain in my head, so I, no, of course I wouldn't. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Interesting. I it, yeah, yeah, no, I just want to know everything there is to know about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Let us head to Xbox Corner that I still think should have a jingle, but, you know, that's just me. <laughs> I love, yeah. Bum, 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 only on Xbox. We can go this way. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, that's, we're hoping to turn that one around. Uh, okay. give, us, have, give us a, an Activision Blizzard in a second here. I could have Copilot create a jingle for Xbox Corner. There surely. <laughs> yep. It would be the yeah. It would be the alien defeat sound, and all your base are belong to us. Yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> so uh, usually twice a month, we Microsoft releases some list of Game Pass titles that are coming for those two weeks. You know, across uh, console, PC, and cloud, right? And we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for the first Activision Blizzard games. And they've already pre-announced this. Remember, they had that special event. I think it was in February. Yeah, it must have been February for uh, the Xbox. February? I don't remember. It was. it was a while ago. Who cares? Um, and they pre-announced or announced that the first of those games would be Diablo. But now we're finally getting, a Diab sorry, Diablo 4. Mm. Um, that's finally about to happen. So on March 28th, which is about a week from tomorrow, I guess, um, we will finally, finally get the first Activision Blizzard game via Xbox Game Pass. And then, of course, we know that going forward, they've promised to do that day and date for all the first-party games. So it was something they had said before, but now that you know Activision Blizzard is part of Microsoft, uh, they're reiterating that. So as big new titles or any new titles come out uh, through those studios, we'll, we'll get and them It's day a and current date. game. It was only released last year, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, right. They're it not doing the back catalog. Yep. I mean, they will. <laughs> and honestly, I'm kind of looking forward to it. But yeah, uh, but yeah, they're starting with Diablo 4, so that's cool. Cool. Um, there's some other good stuff uh, in here. Uh, this isn't always the case. Um, Ark Survival Ascended is supposed to be a big game. I've not actually played it. Um, Super Hot isn't wasn't that one of the first like kind of big modern era VR games? The original version was that. Am I thinking of the right thing? That kind of raster graphic, I don't know, shooter kind of a thing. But anyway, um, I'm hoping this is the start of something big. Um, well, it is the start of something big. I'm just hoping it happens quickly. So now that we're finally in Activision Blizzard Game Pass season, let's see. We'll see what happens. So no promises, but it's starting finally. Um, there, I don't know if anyone follows this. I'm sure there are some people out there who use Microsoft Rewards, right? And so this is the way that Microsoft um, rewards people for <laughs> using their products and services, right? I mean, it's it's a, I don't know, what do you call this kind of a thing? Like a... It's, it's a like reward a, program. Yeah, I guess loyalty it's all it is, card yeah. sort of situation. Loyalty, yeah. The idea is like, you know, use Bing and like you do, like every day there's like little challenges. You do them and you get some points and then you can turn those points into gifts, right? They, they turn into money, right? So, you know, you spend 17 hours using Bing and you get like a $5 Microsoft store gift card or something or whatever it is. Um, they've, there's been weird things going on with Microsoft Rewards over the past few months where people are, who are very heavy users of it are complaining like the rewards are going down. It's starting to disappear from certain places. It looks like it's about to go away. And then Microsoft's going, no, no, we're still doing it. You know, so um, there is today a standalone Microsoft Rewards app on Xbox. They are getting rid of that. In fact, it's happening very quickly. Um, in April, they're going to get rid of it. But that's because there's a new rewards tab. If you, if you go like on the Xbox, hit the white button, the Xbox button, go up to your profile. You'll see there's some tabs there, you know, your games or whatever, your activity. But one of them is now rewards, right? And this is where your Microsoft rewards are. And they're promising, they've actually taken away a few ways that you can earn Microsoft rewards points by doing certain activities. That was like a feature of the app. But it, they promise they're going to bring at least some of those back and there's more coming and, you know, whatever we'll see. But I don't know what the cross section is of people who um, are active Microsoft rewards users i guess uh and xbox fans but there must be some right i mean i i could imagine them basically paying you use bing but i think a lot of xbox guys just use xbox right they don't <laughs> they're not doing it for the rewards necessarily but normally wouldn't mention linkedin at all let alone in the game section but because everything is terrible now uh linkedin is experimenting with casual games and I that because that's what this. you do why you're looking for a job and then you get distracted by a game and actually honestly <sighs> This might be good data for a potential uh, employer because that's they can true. see how easily, right? <laughs> oh, look I don't at how long the they played it, this stupid It's like, game oh, look, they applied for a job and then they spent 15 minutes playing this <laughs> stupid tile game. Was... <laughs> no, not that guy. Um, so that's awful. I don't know what to say. I, I <laughs> Look, even it. something like net. Yeah, it's awful. Like, well, what I mean is we live, <sighs> gamification as a thing is whatever. You know, like I'm using Duolingo to try to learn Spanish and the gamification of that app is, you know, working or whatever. It's like, I get it. Um, 
Netflix adding games, I sort of get. It's vaguely another kind of entertainment. And I guess that's sort of the business they're in, sort of. I don't like that it's in the app. I feel like there should be a Netflix games app. I agree. And yeah. it should be separate. But of course, they Netflix doesn't care what I want. They don't even let me make folders of different types of shows. <laughs> so <laughs> they have their own strategy. It has nothing to do with what I want. Uh, but it's, it's sort of in the same area. This thing, I what? What are you doing? What is? What I don't is this get it to do with at all did? whatsoever. I don't okay. know why, other than like this should be. I wanted to check if it was April first. This should have waited I, until April. I know 1st. It, it's. Yep, it doesn't make any. Right, it's like an onion headline. LinkedIn is adding games. Like, yeah, because you're because you, you're unemployed and you have free time. Right, it's kind of know. depressing, I, isn't I, it? Oof. It's sad, is what. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't. I I I have to use LinkedIn because uh, I have a, like this stupid little business now, and I hate it. <laughs> and not the business, the LinkedIn I hate. It's stupid. It's awful. So like the notion that I would go there and be, they already send me ads as messages. I, like yes. That's the, uh. What the, what is, you know, so what am I going to get like a little notification? Oh, Amex has something they want to tell you. And this, that what they want to tell me is let's play chess. No. <laughs> oh, Paul, <laughs> you, know, you like haven't tried out sense. this new game yet. Why don't you try out Crazy. this new game, Paul? <laughs> Crazy. Anyway. Okay. Uh, and then finally, uh, Sony, interestingly, was, did a uh, was fairly successful with VR with the with the PlayStation Four with the original PS VR, mm -hmm. um, which is about three hundred fifty dollars. And then they came up with the VR Two for the PS Five, which I think started at six hundred dollars, but is not today anyway five hundred and fifty dollars, which is more expensive than the console. And uh, you will be shocked to discover they haven't sold any. Mm. And uh, it's not doing very well. So apparently they've halted production. Uh, they previously announced that they would look, they were looking at, and I think will be bringing it to the PC, which is interesting on some level. But I think the big problem here is the cost. Like that's just. I honestly didn't know they had a second version of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and no, how do you, and how do you compete well. with the Quest 3 on that? Yeah. You're trying to go to the PC. Like, good luck. Well, I, I they have a, they, you know they have this audience, right? There is a there's a PlayStation fan base. Yeah, um, absolutely. I've yeah. I've not. They bought tried PS5. It, so I can't speak to, to the quality. But. For it to be more than the cost of the stinking console itself. That, it that was true sense. with the PlayStation Four and the original VR headset, right? The PlayStation Four was yeah, about, but it was still a couple hundred bucks less expensive. A couple hundred right? bucks less. Like I think the, there's the, the threshold. The PS5 right? is also more. Expensive You're right. That's it. Yeah. That's it exactly, Richard. There's a threshold, and I, it's yeah. definitely past. Yeah. It was like two fifty for a PS4 and three fifty for the headset. Right now, yeah, it's, and I don't this is the, for the PS5. Five, this was the, the, the co-pilot for Microsoft 365 disconnect for me, uh, especially for consumers where it's like, so I pay a hundred bucks a year for, for six people to get a terabyte of storage through mm -hmm. Microsoft 365, all the apps, blah, blah, blah. And now you want me to pay 20 bucks per month per user. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like for like, that's a, that like that jump is incommensurate, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to me. But actually, like I said, not today, but in the past, you know, using that service, actually, I'm like, okay, actually, there's some, there's some value here. But yeah, I it's don't. Funny, it's no funny you bring that up. I just had a lunch with a couple of business leaders and mm -hmm. their IT person who brought me in, talking about incorporating it. Uh, you know, what what they need to be concerned about lighting up M365 uh, Copilot, yeah. and the CFO was the one saying, you know, I I had to I had to do this survey thing, and I. Yeah. Knew it was going to take me an hour and a half, and I ran it through Copilot, and it was done in ten minutes, and that paid for the month right there. Nice, yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. I mean, I think I had a similar experience. I well, I I use it mostly for graphics, but in my case, uh, it wasn't so much that it was costing me less to do the thing I was already doing. It's that I couldn't have done the thing I'm doing now. Right. I just there there was no amount of money. Yeah. That would make that would make it make sense for me to go to a, I have a friend who's a graphic artist and say, I would like four images of this ridiculous scene I just described. But don't ask, <laughs> and then uh, come back with those four, and I'll right. say one of these is pretty good, but could you change this? And then by the time we've arrived at the image, it's two weeks later, and I don't know what I'm doing anymore right. because this is just a news story. Like I. It's that moment, so, it, 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 the, it, um, on one hand, it's embarrassing art. On the other hand, it's instantaneous embarrassing art. So you're okay with it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look, Explaining I don't ask person, why I need a picture of Ronald McDonald in space. The point yeah, is, I need exactly. this picture and I need it now. Mostly you're paying you know? to not be shamed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. You're paying right behind the shame. Uh, I would like uh, to. So I will pay $20 about not to be shamed. Not to be shamed publicly. <laughs> uh, but then, of course, I put the 
picture on an article and I am yeah. shaped. So, uh, but the, the, v, uh, the PSVR two, I, you know, I don't feel like there's any, um, similar advantage to it. Like I just don't, it, but it, I, I, I'm almost feeling like we've run our course with gaming VR. Like if yeah, it was going to take off, it would have by now. Yeah. If, uh, you know, uh, Gabe Newell and the co at, at steam that made that made Alex, it was a total loss leader because those guys can afford it. So they pulled together the right. ringer team. They made the best VR game they could make. And it is a beautiful it, work of art. All accounts is amazing. A beautiful, beautiful work of art. Um, yeah. And it still isn't enough. Right. Right. So if that's not going to do it, and that's four years old, four years old. I know. I don't know I what it takes. I want to play it so bad, but I just don't have a, the means to. <laughs> I know. I know. It's a, yeah. Right. Same. Yep. Because I love Half-Life, but. Well, it's one of the things that's interesting about it is how much time Alex spends trying to get you to look in the right direction. <laughs> Like you, you also see the problem with storytelling in VR, which right. is you're so busy looking at the world, the story can take a hike. I'm busy exploring this world. Yep. That's, uh, it's funny you use that example because uh, some months, a couple of months ago was some, uh, uh, I guess the 20th, 25th anniversary probably for the original Half-Life, 20th, 30th, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, there was a documentary they made, which was fantastic. And one of the the great stories that's told in that documentary is how, uh, because that, the story is an, in, it's an interactive story, right? It's a, mm -hmm. it's a game and there are, there are shooter elements and all that, but really it's just, it's the unfolding of a story. And sometimes you walk into a big room and stuff's happening and they need you to see the little crack and the thing. And they, they, that part of the game design is they have to make sure you don't miss stuff because right? yep. you could walk through a game and be like, do, 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 like yeah. I do in real life. And you can't be like that when you're playing no. this game. You're like, yeah, this is the thing is yep. the, uh, not just the, be paying attention, but see stuff, you know, see the right and, stuff. Uh, and this is a huge so part they, about you know, good they, game design, a big part of that game design yeah. and making sure they got that stuff. Right. And yeah, I could imagine VR it's worse. Cause of course you're like, oh, it's you're way worse. worse. <laughs> like, like, you know, a good game um, has a good cinematographer, right? knows how to get your eye in place. I, I, I have not listened to this, but as I promised, I wanted to generate a uh, jingle for, for Xbox Corner. Oh, okay. so, oh boy. Yep. Here's, here's what Copilot came up with. Kevin, you ready? Song. When we're in Mexico, one of the many things that's kind of unique and different about that place is that certain things are just like two decades behind the United States. And I don't mean infrastructure. I mean like music videos. And they are, it's like literally the 1990s there from, and yeah. that song is every Mexican music video. <laughs> it's, right? It is, that's what music is like there now. And it is like, we go, certain restaurants just have like a TV on, they play music videos. And I sit there and I'm like, I... <laughs> what am I, what is happening? Like it's like literally like is Debbie Gibson back? Like or Britney Spears or whatever? Right, like right, it's right. like what is this? You know? Oh dear! Yeah. Oh, I think crazy. I, I think I'm, I, and it's a lot of that stuff. You know, Xbox, an electro synth Xbox. version of the Xbox startup noise would be fine. It's a jingle. It should be. It should two be. Seconds. Yeah, exactly. That's right. what I said. I right. even said to it, make a very short jingle. Right. And it was yeah. still way too long. No, this uh, was like a girl in a course. tracksuit dancing and singing at the same time somehow on stage with a bunch of yeah. other people all, <laughs> yeah. you know, all doing weird synchronous. Dances. Maybe yep. some of them are on skates. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. <laughs> like people are moving in between and, you know, yeah, that's exactly, that's every video. Oh, man. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, it's weird. Well, we will be back in just a moment <laughs> after that horrible <laughs> song with the tips and picks of the week uh, oh, in man. just a sec. Welcome back to Windows Weekly, this week hosted by me, Micah Sargent, as well as your tried and true panelists, Paul Therott and Richard Campbell. It's time for the back of the book, otherwise known as the tips and picks of the week. Yeah, I just realized I have PTSD from that music. Um, it is <laughs> It's not okay. It's, <laughs> it's not, not okay. okay. It's uh, Richard just brought up Alex. Uh, Alex is one of the many games that are on sale right now. And you got to be quick, unfortunately, because if you uh, listen to the show like as late as uh, Friday or Saturday, it's over. But through the 21st, which as we record this is tomorrow, uh, Steam is having a big sale. 
And it is a big, it is a big sale. Like almost everything, not everything, but almost everything is on sale. Some really, really good prices on stuff. And I don't just mean like older stuff. Like you can buy all the old, like, um, you know, the doom and quake type games, like that stuff is always like a couple of bucks when it's on sale, but it's, you know, newer titles. You can get the Halo Master Chief collection, all those games, like for 10 bucks. Uh, yeah. Jet, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order for three ninety nine. Uh, Sid Meier's Civilization Six, six ninety nine, that kind of thing. There's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, you may um, never get around to playing them all, but at least you'll own them. But you'll you save a lot. Spent of a lot. That's yeah. how I yeah. am you'll when spend. I get you yeah, know if yeah. I get because I actually am not yeah. a gamer at all. But I, I get right. these but stupid. Your, your Steam movies. collection is awesome. With, uh, yeah, it is. Movies like if a movie <laughs> like I like hits like four ninety nine, I'll just buy it. And it's yeah. like, am I going to watch this again? Yeah, yeah, it's still in shrink wrap, but you know it's it's there if I need it. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Maybe someday the world will end. I'll just have this collection. It'll be fun. Um, and then, uh, da, 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 so that's my tip. Uh, and then I have I have three app picks. I'm going to blow through these really quickly. But um, Stardock Object Dock 3 came out today. It's $9.99 or $3.99 to upgrade. It's now part of Object Desktop. If you have that suite, this adds a Mac, Mac OS 10 style dock uh, to Windows. And you can you know either augment the taskbar or replace it. You can have multiple docks on every side of the screen if you're into that kind of thing. They can be folders and tabs and blah, whatever. So it's pretty cool. It works really nicely. Uh, it's 64-bit. Works on Windows 10 and 11. Good stuff. Um, Proton Mail, uh, the native app, is available now on Mac and Windows and on Linux and beta, interestingly. They've had a web app for, I want to say, 10 or 12 years, a long, long time. But this is the privacy-focused service that has a bunch of Proton dot, dot, dot services. Uh, Proton Mail is supposed to be one of the better ones. And I am considering this right now, i got to say. They also have a, um, like a, password manager or no no i'm sorry they have a what do you call it a uh like an authenticator app as well they've oh, gotcha. so yeah, yeah. they're worth looking at um and then uh there's a new version of firefox out because it's been four weeks and there's some improvements kind of across the board but they improved the performance of jump lists on windows so if you're that guy you use fireworks firefox and actually know what a jump list is and use one uh god love you <laughs> it's, it's it's they're both are better uh, on Windows, anyway. All right. Uh, then let's see what is next. Ah, oh, it's time. Oh, wait. Yeah, did you mention bum, the, bum, the Firefox bum. thing? Did yes. I miss one? Yeah, I yeah. did. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, I was reading. There'll be a quiz later. Uh, at the same time Micah as you. can tell us. I Micah can tell us what he thinks the jump list is. But <laughs> I didn't it's realize okay. somebody uh, Proton uh, products these days. So I was. Yeah, there's a bunch. Um, yep. Tell us about Run as Radio, Richard Campbell. Ah, this week's episode is with a past guest coming back again, Steve Buchanan, uh, known on Twitter as Bukatech. Uh, been a good, who's always been a platform guy. I've talked about Kubernetes and things like that. But we ended up in this sort of meta conversation about how every sysadmin these days is a platform engineer to some degree. It's just a question of how seriously you take it. And so that ended up being the title from sysadmin to platform engineer. Just recognizing that our job when we do it well is to provide platforms for places for work to be done for our organization. You know, whether you're the administrator of the M365 uh, tenant or if you are managing a set of servers to run applications, it's all the same issue. It's, it does the, is the platform able to respond to the needs of the organization and how do we get better at that? So, you know, it's not, and products facilitate that, but it's more a mindset than it is products. And Steve really pulled all that together really well for us to to really get our head around and go, yeah, don't you don't do Kubernetes because it's fun. You do it because it allows you to provide a platform that serves the applications your organization counts on. Nice. Well, you can find that at runasradio.com. Uh, and the Brown Liquor Pick of the Week, uh, interestingly, I was uh, mm. just chatting with the person who brought you that Bushmills uh, recently. Oh, were you? Yeah. That was yeah. from last week. Yeah, from last week. So what is the Brown Liquor Pick of the Week this week? This week is a story. Um, the, the whiskey that is listed in the sheet is not how the story is going to begin. The story is going to begin with a listener, Barry Wallace, who, while on a cruise tweeted to me the menu of whiskeys available on his cruise and said like, which one should I try? And I ran down a bunch of them that I recognized, but there was one on the list I hadn't seen. And this doesn't happen very often anymore. Uh, for better or worse, I'm pretty good at remembering things. And so if I had seen it before, I would have I recognized it. But one of them on the list was called Maclow. 
and which is called an American single malt whiskey, which is interesting because the U.S. has no concept of a single malt whiskey, really. Um, single malt is an invention of Smiths and Sons, Glenn Livett, back in the 1960s when they wanted to show that their product was more premium. It never really meant anything, although it was later codified initially to be the idea that it was from a malting of barley. But in reality, now really means a given distillery has produced and distilled all of the products that are in the bottle. So single malts don't mean as much as it is said. There's lots of pretentious folks that say, well, I'll only drink single malts um, when I can make fun of them all day long. And in fact, here's one I'm going to make fun of. Uh, the lady's name is Julie Macklow. Now, Julie come uh, originally from Aspen, but joined JP Morgan as a hedge fund manager, got bitten by the whiskey bug doing her work, but ultimately married an extremely wealthy person, uh, Billy Macklow, who is the son of uh, one of the largest real estate tycoons in, the, in, in New York. So they get married back in 2004, and apparently she goes all in on being a socialite. In fact, there is an article in Vogue about her in 2009 called The Hedge Funder in Thigh-High Boots. <laughs> anyway, and she likes whiskey, which is not a sin. You can be a socialite and like whiskey. Like, all of that is fine. But apparently during the pandemic, she, got, she had been buying up rare whiskeys because it was a great... A lot of folks were unloading their collection because they needed money during the pandemic when... Everything was disrupted. And so um, there's a there's a whole conversation to be had about the dusty bottle movement that as the demand for whiskey skyrocketed during the pandemic, a lot of folks that had forgotten about their collections sort of dug into them and sold really rare whiskeys. And so she decided she should make whiskey and uh, went uh, found a guy named Ian McMillan. Now, Ian McMillan is a proper master distiller. This is a guy who's pushing 50 years working in the whiskey industry, all the way back to Glen Goyne in the, in the 1970s. He's actually well known for rehabilitating older distilleries. So he helped get Deanston back on Rhine and Tobermory, Munahabin down in Eiley. And famously, he's best known at the moment for the Bladnock distillery back in 2017, which is one of the very few lowland distilleries that exists. Like Ian McMillan is the guy. And, uh, and actually, at the moment, he was working for a group called Wolf Craig Distillers. So they're making weird new things. But in between doing Bladnock and this, he was recruited by Julie Macklow. And uh, they went out. We, she had an idea to make whiskey, but didn't actually want to make it. So instead, she found some that she could brand. Mm. And she found it from a distillery called Bull Run, which is out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, and so she bought literally a barrel, one barrel um, pure barley whiskey, which is relatively unusual in the United States, which normally uses corn, but this was 100% barley, aged in American oak. Uh, it had been barreled in 2014. She then removed that barrel from the storage in Oregon and put it for a couple of years in somewhere in Kentucky. I haven't been able to find out where, but one of the Rick houses there, there's plenty. And then bottled it in 2021, an entire 271 bottles, which is typical for a single barrel, uh, somewhere in there, somewhere between 200 up to 300, depends. Which she probably priced at $1,500 US each. Woof. Yeah. Now, being a socialite, this is somebody who eats dinner out in New York at a top tier restaurant five, six times a week. So she had a pretty and was, you know, sociable with everyone around there. She's a socialite. So she pretty much sold the whiskey herself going from fancy restaurant to fancy restaurant, uh, getting this um, uh, this $1,500 edition, which they call the black edition out uh, all over the place. She also you can also find it. Like I said, there's only a handful of bottles, although apparently they're making additional editions. Uh, outside of New York and some places in Texas, Los Angeles, Vegas, uh, and uh, Aspen, of course. Um, Jean Georges apparently was an early backer on this. So definitely got this strong restaurant bar tie for it. The professional whiskey people have tasted it. They have declared it a wood bomb, which is to say it has spent too long in wood, which is normal for anything that's gone seven, eight years in this part of the world. Uh, tannic and bitter. Oh, Lord. So not I, good. I, I would point out that most photos related to this particular whiskey showed in a cocktail. In fact, apparently today, 
If you would like to, in New York, you can go to a very swanky club called Gabriel's. Well, they will sell you a $45 cocktail called the Gold Fashion. Oh, sorry, what? $45. $45. Yeah. So made the with gold the fashion. <laughs> black edition. Yes. They recently have announced, as of last year, um, yeah. a new edition called the Kentucky Gold Edition. Uh, they've only been taking... Um, pre-order so nobody's actually tasted it although the description of it is lovely which you know they call it tasting notes except for that part where nobody's actually tasted mm -hmm. it and they're going to want 260 dollars for this that would be by the way more money than the retail price on a pappy bang winkle 23 no way yes <sighs> which is why it? i did not want to talk about this whiskey you know like yeah. when hmm. When Barry led me to it, I hadn't seen before. Of course, I did the research and I only got angrier and angrier <laughs> and angrier reading this until I went back to the root of this, which was Bull Run, right? That our friend Julie went and bought a barrel for Bull Run. And Bull Run is out of Portland, Oregon. It's been around since 2010. Uh, Lee Madoff, who worked his way through different breweries and different distilleries and so forth, set this up himself. He makes a variety of different whiskeys, but he makes a whiskey that very likely was the starting point of the black edition called the Bull Run Single Malt. And he's also been part of the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission, which is trying to be establishing standards for what we would call an American Single Malt. Uh, by the way, that bottle, 50 bucks, mm -hmm. which is more in line with the price of a, of a, yeah, of a whiskey should be. You'll find it up to 100. There's a few different editions of it. He makes a bourbon as well. They, he does a Pinot Noir aged whiskey, which I might just want to try, as well as some vodkas and things like that. It spends five years in oak, which is more appropriate for that climate. Uh, and it, uh, yeah, it's more, and you can find it. It's, it's buyable. It's at BevMo. You know, not a big deal. You're you're gonna have a tough time finding any of the Maclos, and I would recommend that you don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Why don't you drink the Origin product? You'll be happier. And the current specification for what an American single malt whiskey. So the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission is in the process of ratifying this standard. So that single malt whiskey means 100% malted barley from the U.S. So U.S. barley distilled at a single distillery, same as they do in Scotland. Uh, also aged in the U.S. and barrels no larger than 700 liters and uh, distilled no higher than 80% and bottled no less than 40%. These very similar to what Scottish shingle malt would represent as. Uh, and that's a be far better story than anything to talk about from a New York socialite. Amen. Bull Run, Oregon, single malt whiskey. Portland is fun. Go get some. Yes, Portland's nice. great. Well, not thank like you. New York, uh, jerks. <laughs> I just, like I, you know what? <laughs> I maybe I should apologize. I went on this ride, and now I've made you go on it too. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all yeah. angry. That's why the lights yeah, are like red. Kind of the theme of the whole show, really. We well, went on this ride, and now and, you're going. And, you and go now on. you're going on it. You know, I started. To, I was going to write about the do the story about the Mac Low, and I was working my way through it. And I finally got to a point where I was like, I'm going to throw this away until I figured out where she got the whiskey from. And then when I read about Lee, I'm like, this guy's awesome. Yeah. This is what whiskey's about. There we go. Well, folks, <laughs> that just about brings us to the end of this episode of Windows Weekly. If you want to subscribe to the show, get the show notes, see all the fun stuff, head to twit.tv slash WW. Uh, that's where you will find links to subscribe to the audio versions and video versions of the show. Uh, I should also mention that you should consider joining Club Twit at twit.tv slash Club Twit. When you join the club, first and foremost, you get that warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that you are helping support what we do here at Twit. Help us keep doing what we do. Uh, $7 a month, $84 a year gets you access to Club Twit, which, which gets you access to ad-free versions of every single one of our shows. You also gain access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra content you won't find anywhere else, including behind the scenes, before the show, after the show, special Club Twit events get published there. 
and access to the members-only Discord server. A fun place to go to chat with your fellow Club Twit members and also those of us here at Twit. Aside from that, you also gain access to the video versions of our Club Twit exclusive shows. So there is the Untitled Linux show, there is Hands on Mac, there's Hands on Windows, there is uh, Home Theater Geeks, and iOS Today. These are all shows that are Club Twit shows. And if you want to see the video versions of those shows, that is what joining Club Twit will get you as well. I should also mention, uh, quite literally, tickets are almost out. Uh, head to tickets.twit.tv if you're a member of Club Twit to sign up to join us in April for a couple of recordings of uh, this week in tech. And it's only, again, available to you if you are a Club Twit member. So you'll have to uh, provide your email that's linked to your Club Twit account so we can confirm and invite you in the uh, for one of those days. But yes, those seats are running out. So if you've been thinking about it, now's the time to hop on that. Twit.tv slash Club Twit, $7 a month, $84 a year. Uh, all right, it is time to say thank you, Richard Campbell, for your work this week uh, anything you'd like to plug any places folks should head to keep up with what you're doing well thank you micah for doing the show with us we always have a great time with you thank you and uh yeah next week i'll be at the fabric conference so you'll see me coming from probably a skyloft at the mgm grand huh. no, uh, no big deal you know as it turns out if you could bring four thousand of your closest friends to the mgm grand they give you a nice room nice nice <laughs> <laughs> that's exciting uh, but, it, but you know run as radio and dot net rocks still making the shows and having a good time doing them. beautiful and of course paul therot at therot.com what's uh what's for your plug this week oh boy i hate doing plugs i just <laughs> you know this is therot.com i'm on twitter and stuff i <laughs> Every time I'm Paul. online, I don't, time, I don't know. I just you find me. <laughs> I do stuff. I write stuff every day. <laughs> you know, you could ask a co-pilot to figure out. <laughs> co-pilot, what, what do say. I do? What do what, I say? What, doing I, this what, what should I sell? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in any case, thank you for tuning in. Uh, watch this week at Google later today, uh, as well as you can watch on Sunday. Um, Leo Laporte will be back, so he and I will be doing Ask the Tech Guys on Sunday, and you can catch the rest of my shows, including Tech News Weekly tomorrow. Um, but until then, it is time to say goodbye, because this episode of Windows Weekly has come to a close. We're closing the window. Ah, uh, it's down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now's the time to play that. <laughs>